Uh, this symposium is being held on the occasion of the installation of the artworks of Anna Masowski, our artist in residence for last year and this year. Uh, this is the culmination of a project that's been in the works, obviously, for well over a year. Uh, we've really been looking forward to this day for a long time. This symposium was co-organized uh, by Gustav Lester and Siobhan Angus. I want to thank them both personally very much for all their hard work uh, bringing this day together. Um, it, took, it took a lot of work, and I really appreciate what they did to bring us all here today. Just to briefly go over the program before I get started, our featured speakers today will appear in two panels, one before lunch and one after lunch. Following the second panel, we will have a coffee break, uh, then a roundtable discussion, which by then I'm sure you will all have lots of questions for our panelists. Following that, we'll conclude our formal program so that everyone will have a chance to view Anna's installation and the museum before the museum closes at 5 p.m. And then from 5 to 6, we will have an after-hours reception downstairs uh, adjacent to the museum, and we hope you'll all be able to stay for that. As today's guest of honor, Anna will be opening the first panel uh, coming up next. Uh, but as sort of a warm-up, as sort of the opening act, and just in case uh, anyone is still on their way here and, and got a little delayed, we didn't want anybody to miss any of her talk, I figured I would start the day off with a little bit of my own work uh, on the earliest, very first history of the rare earth elements. Today's symposium is organized around the intersection, intersecting themes of colors, metals, environments. Anna's glass artwork uses glass colored by rare earth elements to examine the environmental effects of mining these metals. And the three of us organizers were each so excited about this topic in our different areas of study that we wanted a day where we could widen the conversation around those same themes to include chemistry, craft, history, film, environmental studies. We think you'll find the work uh, in this collection of talks comes together in some fascinating ways. Much like we hope for the symposium today, the story of the first rare earth element is not one of solitary work, but of conversation and collaboration among a network of researchers in different lines of work who are invested in a common project. It also happens to be a story about industrial mining management, the scientific quest to catalog nature, and the creation of teeny tiny beads of colored glass. The earliest history of the rare earth elements starts here. Now, especially those of you who are chemists may guess that it starts in the suburban Stockholm archipelago in what's now a vacant lot between seaside homes at the long closed quarry in Itterby. This quarry is indeed the site memorialized in no less than four squares on the periodic table, and it more than deserves the lovely historical markers that are now installed there. We will get back here in a few minutes. But this quarry would only be the beginning of the story if the rocks were the main characters. And if that were the case, that would be a story told in geologic time. This is not actually the story of the rocks. This is the story of the mineralogical chemists who made the case that those rocks contained as yet unknown substances. It's also not a story of a series of individual discoveries of elements. Some of the moments I will talk about today appear on charts like these as they're considered the discoveries of elements. Some of the moments are not. I think it's best to think of all of these developments as actually part of the process of discovery. It's a, a talk for another time that some of you may have seen before. The complicated concept of discovery in the first place. But it all does come together in one, one long process. The early history of the rare earth elements is actually the story of the collaboration of a community of chemists and mineralogists working over the course of decades within a common tradition. When one of the members of this community decided that a heavy black stone in Itterby Quarry was worthy of investigation, this happened within an entire existing research community that was already set up to investigate that. And so, instead of it to be, I'm going to start my story a 45-minute drive away, though it's a much more pleasant trip on the ferry, if you ever go. Uh, here, in Stockholm's old town, in the shadow, literally, of the royal palace. Oops, sorry, lost my place. Yeah. 
the epicenter of Swedish mineralogical research in the 18th century. For 200 years, this building with the columns in the center was the home office of the Swedish Government Bureau of Mines. So the building down the side is the Royal Palace. It's right adjacent to the Royal Palace. Very important to national administration, to the national economy, housed the mint, extremely central. Its grand architecture, its central location reflect its prominence in the early modern Swedish economy. At the time the Bureau was founded in the mid 17th century, exports of copper and iron were the central income generators for the Swedish crown. And iron exports especially would go on to fund Swedish military endeavors in its imperial years, while at the same time providing almost all of the iron with which the British Empire was built. The country's largest copper mine in Falun operated for over a thousand years and only just closed in the 1990s. The Bureau of Mines centrally managed all the country's mines, and by the early 18th century, it employed mineralogists to use scientific methods to perfect the entire production process. At that time, the methods and material knowledge needed to mine and work metal fell in general outside the realm of academic study and were instead learned and taught as artisanal skills. So finding officials for the Bureau for the skilled management of mines was not as simple as just seeking those with a university education. The Bureau thus began training its own officials, adding an entry-level internship position. Accepting an average of about five interns per year, they trained hundreds of mining mineralogists over the course of a century. The Bureau did expect its incoming interns to have a solid education in chemistry, though, to the point that the Bureau's board members exerted considerable pressure on the universities, particularly the new chemistry department at the University in Uppsala, to keep their curriculum rigorous and specifically focused on mining relevant mineralogy. So in this way, within a decade or two, the Bureau had created a national research network spanning government, industry, and academia, all focused specifically on the chemical analysis of rocks. One well-known working partnership that exemplifies this community is a trio who were hugely productive in the 1770s and 1780s. Torben Bergman on the left, was a young professor of chemistry at Uppsala who had been essentially handpicked for his position by the board of the Bureau of Mines. Johann Gottlieb Gahn on the right was a student of Bergman's upon his graduation with his PhD in the face of what was a terrible academic job market even then. The professor placed his student as an intern at the Bureau and Gahn went, to, went on to spend his entire career back in his hometown of Falun managing the Falun copper mine. In the center is Carl Wilhelm Scheele, sort of. Uh, Carl Wilhelm Scheele never had his likeness made during his lifetime, so all images you ever see with his name on it are either uh, a memory, a guess, or somebody else entirely. But it'll stand in. Scheele was a chemist from Swedish Pomerania who first joined the community in Uppsala, making the acquaintance of Gan, who then introduced him to Bergman. For many years, the three corresponded about their projects among themselves and more broadly among Swedish mineralogists, assisting one another, conducting replications, and publishing together. Scheele was a chemist, both in the scientific sense and in the sense that he was a professional pharmacist. But as a member of the community alongside Gahn and Bergman, he worked on the projects, within the methods, and with the tools all common to mineralogy. The projects I'll get back to in a moment, but first I'll say a few words about the methods and the tools. By the early 18th century, mineralogy was a scientific field of natural history alongside botany and zoology and with the desire to catalog the mineral kingdom alongside the animal and vegetable kingdoms. Uppsala was a nexus of natural history by the 1730s and Linnaeus himself had included the mineral kingdom in the first version of his Systema Naturae. Linnaeus and others intended to identify and classify minerals in the same manner as plants and animals, organizing them according to their outward characteristics unfortunately for the Linnaeans, many of the outward characteristics of rocks and stones that could be called form are at best variable, like color, and at worst taxonomically useless, like size or shape. It was also clear that rather than a manageable set of species to be hierarchically identified, there's also a nearly endless possibility for combination across all levels of classification. So the concept that grew within the Bureau in response was basically a reduction to practicality. For the purposes of the mining industry, 
pure substances for market were the ultimate goal. And pure substances are most practically defined as the end products of analysis that can't be broken down any further. The historian Yalmar Fors has shown that this was the moment that metals first became a category of elements. Chemically trained mineralogists like those at the Bureau developed two main methods of assessing rocks component substances, the wet way, acid testing, and the dry way, which involved heating mineral samples to extreme temperatures and observing their various melting points, reactions to additives called fluxes, and of course, the colors they make when they're added to glass. Oops, I have these backwards, so let me, uh, there we go. Between the two, one could conclusively identify a mineral, known or unknown, regardless of its outward appearance. In 1758, the Bureau official Axel Frederick Kronstadt published a groundbreaking new entire system of mineralogy based entirely on chemical analysis, proposing that minerals should not only be identified, but also classified based on their component substances. As an idea, this system was extremely well received across Europe. Where it ran into resistance abroad was in its implementation in everyday mineralogy. While wet analysis was manageable with essentially what we would recognize as a chemistry set, dry analysis required a massive laboratory furnace, substantial rock samples, and time that could stretch to days. What Sweden had that other countries lacked was practical portable dry analysis in the form of the blowpipe. The blowpipe was a handheld tool used since antiquity by artisans. It's a small tube through which air is blown across a candle flame to heat a pea-sized sample of rock. For any size of fire to reach the necessary temperatures, the stream of air needs to be continuous. And for this, the Swedes used a circular breathing technique, reducing the required equipment for dry analysis to not much more than a pencil-sized tube and a candle. The blowpipe was accessible, inexpensive, and portable, and it made dry analysis possible on a miniature scale using tiny samples in a fraction of the time. Blowpipe analysis was not unique to Sweden, but it was uniquely ubiquitous there, thanks to the community built around the Bureau. Swedes published guides to its use in multiple languages, complete with illustrations. But readers soon found that the technique really couldn't be learned from books any more than you could learn to play a musical instrument just by reading it. Within the Swedish community, however, aspiring mineralogists learned this largely embodied skill in person from each other. The blowpipe provided them with data that was mutually understood and a common method for replication and further investigation that was quick and cheap to use, requiring only tiny samples to be carried or even put in the mail. With it, Swedish chemists collaborated on analyses not only across institutional boundaries, but also across geographical distance and decades long time spans. So, in 1751, Kronstedt, then a young assessor for the Bureau, published two papers, the same year, in the Transactions of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Both papers made use of the blowpipe and the new mineralogical research framework. In one, he described an ore that he'd been sent and concluded that he had found a new species of metal, which he dubbed nickel. The, in the other, he described samples of two similar unusually heavy stones from separate mines, which he chose to describe together as one new type of stone and which came to be called, quite simply, heavy stone, or tungsten. Shayla published a short analysis of one of the varieties of Kronstedt's heavy stone, tungsten, in 1781, again producing this unusual new white earth. Bergman added a note asserting that his own results predicted that the earth was actually the oxide of a metal. Two years later, Jose and Fausto del Huyar, Spanish brothers who had studied mineralogy with Torben Bergman and Uppsala and had recently returned home, announced that they had isolated this metal, tungsten. So now we come back to Isterby. Carl Axel Arrhenius, no relation to Svante Arrhenius, but himself, an artillery officer who had studied at the Bureau's chemical laboratory, identified an unusually heavy black stone in the quarry at Itterby in 1787. In 1788, two Bureau mineralogists published separate chemical analyses of it, and in 1794, a third analysis was published by Johann Gadolin, former student of Bergman, currently professor of chemistry at the University of Obo, also known as Turku, in Swedish Finland. 
Guttling's 1794 paper, titled Examination of a Black Heavy Stone from Itterby Quarry in Roslagen, gives his analysis of the stone. He states that it consists of 31 parts silica earth, 19 parts alumina earth, 12 point parts iron calx, and 38 parts an unknown earth. Two replication studies soon followed in which the stone came to be called gadolinite and the earth came to be called yttria. However, in his paper, Gadolin wrote, quote, I'm reluctant as yet to claim a new discovery. He's, he continued, science would be better served if the many new earths described by chemistry in recent years could be separated into simpler constituent parts than if their number were to be simply further increased. So here, Gadolin lists three earths and a calx. In late 18th century chemical mineralogy, calxes were known to be the compound substance resulting from the chemical reaction of a metal that are composed partly of that metal, which definition corresponds largely with an oxide in Lavoisier's, at, at that point, brand new system. Earths, on the other hand, were a distinct class of elements across European chemical systems known to be irreducible by any available methods. In 1794, on uh, Gadolin's publication, there were five earths from which all stones seem to be composed. Silica, magnesia, barita, clay, and lime. Gadolin's yttria would be added to the list along with others around the same time, including zirconia, strontia, and beryllia. Early in the 19th century, chemists also began dividing the list into two groups, as half of them had alkaline properties, so these were called alkaline earths. Around the time that Yttria joined the list, other Swedish community members were taking a new look at Kronstedt's tungsten. Wilhelm Hissinger, another former student of Bergman who had also served as a Bureau of Mines intern, had inherited ownership of the mine that had been the source of Kronstedt's second sample. He had taken on an intern, an unemployed recent med school graduate by the name of Berzelius, and in 1802, as one of their first projects, they did a reanalysis. Soon they claimed that they had isolated the oxide of an unknown metal, naming it cerium, after the newly discovered asteroid Ceres. At the same time, however, the famed German chemist Martin Klaproth published his own reanalysis, and he claimed discovery of essentially the same substance, but as what he defined as an earth rather than an oxide. So the resulting priority dispute between is this an earth or is this a metal oxide highlighted the tension inherent in the category of earths at that moment, that they were chemically far more similar to decomposable substances like calx calxes or oxides, than they were to other elemental substances. In 1808, Humphrey Davy proposed to solve it all by presenting a very short paper dismantling the concept of Earths entirely. He showed that by electrolysis, he had reduced five Earths to simpler substances after all. For most chemists, this suggested that all of the Earths were in fact metal oxides. Davy himself began using the word yttrium to refer to the metal element assumed to be a component of yttria years before it was eventually isolated. Once the periodic table as we know it came into being decades later, Davy's resulting elements, barium, strontium, calcium, and magnesium, topped with beryllium from beryllia earth, formed the vertical group known as alkaline earth metals. Of course, electrolysis also solved the priority dispute over cerium as there were no longer any elemental earths for it to be a part of, cerium joined yttrium as an elemental rare earth metal. So this is the point where I will end my story for today. At that moment, the history of the rare earth enters a period of continuous reanalysis and subsequent separation of samples of gadolinite and cerite into more and more distinct new elements. This story is all about the various strange ways that individual credit to individual chemists gets preserved across various reanalyses and redefinitions. One quick example being the much later identification of another new element in a sample of the gadolinite. One, a material that's not actually usually found in gadolinite, but because it was found in gadolinite, it was named gadolinium, and this inadvertently made 
Gadolin, the first person whose name appeared in the periodic table, despite not being involved in that process. <laughs> what I hope to leave you with today is that the early history of the rare earth elements is not the story of the stones themselves, but of the dedicated community of mineralogists who shared a common idea of what to do with them when they found them. So I want to thank you all once again for coming out today for our program. Our own little community of researchers assembled just for today spans academia, nonprofits, the arts, and industry. And we are really excited for the collaborative conversations we want to start today. All right, everyone. Um, thank you and welcome to our first panel on color materials and the environment. Um, thank you, Charlotte, for that very illuminating introduction to the early history of rare earth metals. Um, so today, I'm just going to introduce each of our three panelists, and then I'll invite you to come up in order. Um, and after each presentation, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. So once you've done presenting, you can stay up and sort of field questions from the audience, and I'll keep an eye on time. So our first um, paper is by our guest of honor. Anna McClowski is the Haas Short-Term Fellow and Artist in Residence at the Science History Institute, where she is co-hosted by the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University. She is researching the history of rare earth elements, the socio-ecologic impact of their extraction, and the way that they enable a globalized society. Anna holds a BA in glass from the Royal Danish Academy and an MFA in sculpture from the University of Washington. Her work has been widely exhibited as, and is in the collection of major museums and galleries. Her talk today is titled Enabling Transparency. Our second presentation is by Roger Turner. Roger Turner is a historian and research curator at the Science History Institute. His particularly scholarly expertise is in 20th century atmospheric science, scientific instruments, and environmental monitoring. At the Science History Institute, Roger helped launch the student role-playing game Science Matters, The Case of Rare Earth Elements, worked on the film The Instrumental Chemist, developed the playful online experience Instruments of Change, and contributes to museum exhibitions. He wrote and curated Mechanochemistry, The Science of Crush for Google Arts and Culture, and also authors the occasional distillation story. Roger's talk is titled The Life, Half-Life, and Afterlife of Wells Bash Gaslighting. And our final paper is by Maddie Stone. Maddie is a freelance journalist who covers climate change and energy technology for Grist, National Geographic, The Washington Post, The Verge, and more. She has a particular interest in the resource demands of clean energy transition and the extractive industries underpinning it. Before going freelance, Maddie was the managing editor at the climate news site Earther, and before that, she was a science editor at the technology site Gizmodo. Maddie holds a PhD in Earth and Environmental Sciences from Penn and lives in Philadelphia. Maddie will be presenting on rare earth metals and the clean energy revolution. So at this point, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. I'm going to take my mask off for the talk since I was told that that's okay and I prefer seeing faces when we can. Um, so as an artist, my work is very different than that of a historian, scientist, researcher in general. And today for the talk, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that I learned while being here, but then also talk about the things that I'm working on as physical responses to what I learned and also as an introduction to the artwork that's on display downstairs in the lobby in the display case. Um, so the talk is titled Enabling Transparency, and it has something to do with that we use cerium to make glass transparent and clear, but it's also about, um, for me, looking into the mysteries of uh, these elements and then figuring out how can they become more understandable for me, more transparent. So starting off kind of in a little bit where Charlotte left off, um, 
The rare earths are the elements 57, 71, a lot of you will know that here, and on the periodic table, and they make up some of the last discovered elements. Um, rare earths received very little attention until um, the dawn of the atomic age. In the 1930s, with the race to invent uh, the atomic bomb, a lot of pure uranium was needed. And so rare earths uh, were a contaminant in uranium and they had to be separated out. And then you were left with all these materials that nobody knew what to do with them. And so since they had no use, they started looking into possible uses also for these materials to use them a bit more commercially. And it's really nice. I got this image actually from Charlotte and I really like how this is an old periodic table and we just let's, let's leave them out, they don't matter. And it's really how, how much we, we did not think about them. So uranium is not a rare earth, but uh, technically, but it, the history and use of uranium and rare earths are so interdependent that um, it became included into my research. Mm -hmm. And uh, the atomic age found a lot of uses for uranium, like the glazes uh, for ceramics, uh, especially reds and yellows, and then also in glassware that glows under black light. And... Um, Really, only after the atomic bomb did we start to learn about the dangers of radiation. So um, glass and, and glazes are not really, we don't use uranium anymore as a colorant. Um, today, rare earths have become a critical resource uh, used in all advanced or in a lot of advanced uh, consumer electronics and renewable energy. 90% of the rare earths are mined in China today. And unlike their name, they are not actually rare on the planet, but they just exist in very low concentrations and making them very inefficient to mine. Um, rare earths are separated from the ore using an acid bath process, and uh, the remaining 90% of mined materials becomes toxic mine tailings uh, because the concentration is so low. So securing one ton of rare earth elements produces about uh, 2,000 tons of toxic waste, which is enormous. Uh, for me, as somebody who doesn't really deal with these things. So this image has nothing to do with what I'm going to be talking about, but I really liked it. Uh, so it's up there, so it's not so boring. Um, because for me, it was always the question, you know, when you when I look at a lot of these scientific data, it, it's very unrelatable. And there's something that's a bit more relatable for me was the iPhone because it relies on nearly half of all elements on the planet, which is insane. So when you look at the periodic table, half of these elements are inside your iPhone. And uh, they're playing a really crucial role for the functionality, for the color display, the camera lens, also the reception and call quality. There are different elements that enable all that. And it also made Apple uh, move from being the 85th largest company on the planet to becoming the fifth in just five years, um, which with the invention of the iPhone, and it has surpassed ExxonMobil, which also just means that we are just as dependent on rare earths as we are on oil, which I think a lot of people are really not aware of. Um, and um, then also the largest growing segment of tablet users are kids uh, age three to 10. And um, they are considered the first generation of the rare metal age, as we call this now. And uh, rare earths are really crucial for renewable energy sources, mainly for batteries and in all tech gadgets, like also electronic toothbrushes, for example, and televisions, but light bulbs as well, internet cable, cars and guns, especially cerium for the transparency you needed for light cable internet cable and guns. And um, so a basic phone weighs uh, about 56 gram and but takes 31 kilos of resources to produce it. So it gives also a little bit of a perspective of what goes into this tiny little gadget. So now I move on from her, her prettiness. So the extraction uh, for uh, rare earths, this is a picture that I found online of um, the Mayan tailing ponds of the Bayanobo mine in China. Um, the concentration that we find is a, between 2 to 10 percent in the ore, and the rest of this dug up material goes into mine tailings until the remaining material goes into the piles, the rare earths have to be separated with these acid baths. So the tailings are toxic waste, 95% of the material that's originally extracted becomes toxic. 
and um, ninety percent of their rare earths are, are mined in China. And uh, California has a uh, the U.S. has one rare earth mine in California, the Mountain Pass mine, but it's not currently in use and operation because in the U.S. the standards for operating it, the ecologic standards, are so high that uh, it doesn't. It's too costly. It doesn't make it econom economic enough to do this here. So we import all of it, and. We can't really compete with the prices we still get from China. We have a lot of estimates around rare earths, but not a lot of facts. Um, the Chinese Society of Rare Earths estimates that per ton of rare earth extracted, uh, 20,000 gallons of acid wastewater and one ton of radioactive residue is produced. And some of the problems that we are seeing is that whenever you're um, mining the ore, it then gets broken down into really fine particles, and these also don't just, they go into the groundwater, they go into the air. Um, so we have pollution that is not just localized, but spreads really easily. Um, and we really lack awareness because we never really buy rare earths just as a product themselves, and we just buy it within gadgets. And since they, these elements are only mined in very few places, mostly in China, Brazil, and Africa, our mineral use is also considered a, a modern form of colonialism. Um, where foreign, foreign run companies um, get all the benefits, but the host countries are left with all of the um, environmental impacts and the problems that result from that. And it makes it very difficult to reason with the companies that host the mining operations um, during all the climate talks of why they should meet our climate goals when we are the ones that are using it. Um, and so, for example, in Peru, the illegal mineral trade is 15% more lucrative than the, the drug market. Um, I think it says a lot. And um, so, what happens is that the foreign-owned companies profit from the mines and leave the host companies with the labor to pay health and environmental costs. And our mineral use is really, when you look at the chart, you can also see that the, for example, Zaire supplies Belgium with two-thirds of its imported copper. And this is not just for rare earths, it's for all the minerals, this chart. And this is not specific to copper. And Guatemala has awarded more than 350 new mining licenses since 2007, mostly to Canadian companies. And also what's staggering about it is that the top eight industrial nations in the world use two-thirds of the world's metal that is produced. And there's 195 countries in the world. And if you think that the top eight are use most of all of it, you can really see who should take the responsibility for what is um, happening environmentally. So moving on to a little bit getting into the things that I've been doing here, this, oh, it's switched. Um, why, so why do I, as an artist working in glass, care about any of this at all? And if you look at the chart, you see that for polishing and glass, um, the, we actually use a fairly large percentage of rare earths um, for glass industry. Of course, I'm talking, I'm working within the glass art industry, which is tiny fraction of the glass industry. But still, um, we have been seeing for um, our, for my processes, I've been seeing the prices increase for glass. And um, uh, this is another chart that I uh, found from a different slideshow about how the prices have increased. And what happened, um, the reason that I got into this and applied for or asked to become here as an artist in residence was that in 2017, we have, 2017 we, the glass art industry had a huge crisis. There are, um, now there's only one company in the world that produces sheet glass that is fusible. So it means all the different colors are compatible with each other. You can put it in the kiln and use it for uh, kiln forming processes like casting and slumping. Um, and uh, this company is called Bullseye. 
uh, the crisis got started with the city of Portland suing Bullseye because their factory is within the city limits and uh, they're also to a, next to a big rail yard but they took it's, it's a mixed industrial and residential area and so the city sued Bullseye for air and ground pollution um, thinking that their melting of glass materials was the reason for the pollution that they found. What happened then was a whole number of lawsuits, but also all of a sudden um, the regulations changed for glass companies in the U.S. where they had to start, they had to upgrade the filtering system to all the factories, which meant that before 2017 we had a number of companies that would produce sheet glass and also glass that we put in our furnaces to melt and they all went bankrupt. So right now the U.S., any glass program, any studio glass facility, any glass studio around the country receives all of their glass for melting in the furnace, their raw colored. They received that from Sweden, Germany and the Czech Republic because there are no companies remaining. Bullseye also bought up um, all of the companies, the recipes from the companies that went bankrupt because they couldn't afford that filtration system. And so what that also meant is that now the prices for um, some of the sheet class has increased by 150-200%. And uh, specifically those glasses that use uh, rare metals. And for in glass we use uh, rare earths in, in a lot of different forms. Like cerium we use for polishing and as a clarifying agent in the glass. And terbium and europium are fluorescent, which we don't use very much. Neodymium, praseodymium, and erbium are used for coloring. And um, on that chart you can see these, especially those pinks and a bunch of greens is what we use the rare earths for. And uh, many of the rare earth colors, which is what I find so interesting and what I've been working with, uh, are color shifting depending on the light source. So they can change color from being under daylight or being under black light or fluorescent light. And that's also what is uh, downstairs in the cabinet. So for the project that the kind of practical part of the project that I've been working on here. I have been getting all of the glass that I use from defunct uh, glass factories in West Virginia and New Jersey, um, mainly from the Gabbard Glass Factory in West Virginia. And there, the factories operated until the 1970s, but between the 40s and 70s, they came up with a lot of recipes and produced a lot of glass that had rare earths in them because back then it was so cheap that they put it into everything. And I can buy there a pound of glass for one dollar, while if I would buy it from Bullseye, the other only company that's left, I pay ten dollars a pound. So it's a huge difference. And I've been working, I've been buying two thousand pounds of glass for them for my project. So we're looking at a completely different price tag here. Um, something that I did, Eric Shelton from uh, UPenn. Um, who I've been in contact through the Science History Institute gave me a number of uh, rare earth oxides. So I worked with students at the Tyler School of Art and we, um, I just went to Target, got a couple of ceramic cups and then we put raw glass into them and mixed it with the oxides, um, about 5% of, of oxides to, to the clear glass and then we melted them um, not in the furnace because we don't have a test furnace, but we use this reheating chamber um, called a glory hole. And so we, we put the crucibles in there, heated them up and got the color to melt. Um, and afterwards, some of them are clear. And you will see that downstairs in the display case that there are some samples that are clear and under black light, um, they actually glow red or green or blue like the cerium, the, the, the big one, the cerium is blue. Um, and there's this brosium and terbium and europium. And it's very wonderful how you have something that has such a shifting identity. Um, so a couple of these samples are downstairs in the display case. Another glass that I got from Gabbard is this color shifting lavender glass. So it's purple under daylight and then under fluorescent light it turns white. And that's the glass I'm mainly working with now. Um, in the beginning, uh, we melted some, some test crucibles and I tried to blow it and see how it behaves. It's a glass that's made for press molding. 
so it it, it freezes really quickly it hardens very fast um, and uh, what I've been doing now is the closest I will ever get to a rare earth mine is on the satellite images so I went on Google Maps uh, take, take, took satellite images this is the mountain pass mine in California and then traced the outlines of each of the layers um, and made uh, digital drawings from them and also small models and got um, wood to uh, do laser cutting. I'm explaining this in a little bit. And this is the piece that's downstairs now in the display case. This is a uh, erbium pink uh, glass. So for me, it was interesting to combine the, to make an object, a vessel of the place where the mineral that it's coloring this vessel is also coming from. So there's this representation of the place, but also of what, what is mined at that place. And this was just a test piece um, that I made to see if the system works, what, I'm, what I was doing. And while I was, I was just a visiting professor at an academy in Poland. And there I made these wooden templates of the biggest, the five biggest rare earth mines in the world. And um, brought them here. And the biggest one is about five feet long, and they're going to be about three feet tall. So they're these substantial vessels. I call them mining vessels. And now I'm, uh, again, at the Tyler School of Art as well, where um, I used all of these um, wooden templates, and I built up a thickness of clay and laid a wooden template on top of it and then squeegee along the clay outline um, to get these flat wooden templates in 3D forms. Then I make molds off of them, plaster silica molds, um, and these molds then go into the kiln. Each mold takes about a week to fire, um, and this is the mold before it gets fired. When it's filled with the pink um, neodymium, it's a, called neolavender glass, and afterwards, once the molds are fired, um, they now get a really basic cold working for now, which is grinding process, and I'm at the moment at the point where they get packed up because I have about a month of grinding left before they can get stacked up and glued together into the vessels. So each layer of the vessel is an individual mold. And then uh, the other thing that I'm working on is I found these, the Minerals of, for Industry, a book uh, here in the archives collection, and got really interested in how we can use the symbols for the different elements um, as a language, um, as a, a symbol language. And so I, I made these sheets of glass that I mirrorized um, by myself. And then uh, last summer I went out into the desert and started uh, taking video for a larger video piece. So this is just a tiny snippet. And I got really interested how we can look at landscape as a common shared resource and something that hosts us or as a site of um, capitalism and extraction and like the, the potential of looking at these the resources kind of our ideas hovering above the landscape so this is uh, the middle is mining shaft and then we have gravel and sand um, that are hovering now over the landscape so this is just a short snippet of a long video piece it's going to be part of, the, of an exhibition eventually as well I also made these small handheld rocks where also those symbols are embedded in that I'm taking out and doing some more filming with. Um, and those are not here at the Science History Institute display case. But what is downstairs is that I also got interested in um, using the polishing process for which we use cerium as a polishing agent. And instead of polishing glass, I polished paper, which you don't really do, to keep the traces of uh, the process. And so downstairs, they are hanging in the display case as these series of prints that just document how something is made or how we work through something in the studio. Um, there, I'm also working with a thousand pounds of uranium glass that for the exhibition um, is going to get put together in different ways. So the nice thing about the uranium is that um, on the top you see it under daylight and then the bottom is under black light so it glows really really strongly and we all know or I think a lot of us know the uranium um, kind of tableware uh, that you can that people like to collect another um, 
piece that's downstairs uh, as a first test piece that I made um, that I've been working on is these cages. Uh, in mining operations forever, they've been used instead of locker rooms. So each miner gets a cage and they put their belongings into that cage and then hoist it up under the ceiling and store their, um, their clothing in there. So I made replicas of of this cage up there. And I'm making 50 of them. So in the exhibition, they're going to be hanging above everything that's on the floor and the videos and the mining objects. This exhibition is planned for much later, far away in the future. Um, what I found really interesting that this is not just a historical um, occurrence that you use these cages, but they still are used today. This is a piece from an Australian, a picture from an Australian mine. And so I've been doing in the past some projects where I used uh, pulling glass cane and wrapping it around forms to make furniture. And so um, for the cage, uh, this is a hanger that I'm wrapping around uh, these uh, graphite blocks in the hot shop. And I'm working with students. I was just up at the uh, Rhode Island School of Design where I showed the students and worked with them on making parts for these cages. So um, to make 50 cages, I need 200 parts um, of one thing 70 parts of another, 80 of another. So I've been twice a week, been working for four hours a day making just parts. And they're also packed up. So this is a pile of the parts for the hangers. And um, they all get put together at some other point uh, in time. If you want to see more of my work in the future, I have an Instagram account where a lot of the kind of in-progress stuff is happening. And I have a website that is a more formal place for finished projects. But on my website, I also keep a research blog because I do on and off work with um, within science. With I did a residency at Corning years ago, at Corning Incorporate, not at the museum with the scientists there. And so a lot of the work when it's finished doesn't contain any of the work that went into making it. And I wanted to make a space for this. So on my website, you can find that. And that would be the end as well of my little presentation of what I've been doing here. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes? What's special about cerium that you use for What cerium? Yeah, what's the special about it? But, well, cerium how you mean like why special in terms of what it does for glass yeah. well we use it for polishing it's the only it's the it's a powder that we apply to the wheel when we want to polish glass it takes off the little kind of haze left from all of the we use carborundum otherwise or diamond to grind glass and then it makes a really rough surface and if you want it shiny you use the cerium and the, the grade of uh, cerium we use is very low uh, in terms of its purity. And, uh, and you get a better polish if you get, take higher grade cerium as well. Um, but it's not so important in the end. Yeah, you wouldn't see the difference. But then the, the thing is that cerium, if, you, if I melt it in a little crucible, it doesn't glow that blue under black light. It really needs a different purity. I found that I couldn't get it to do the same thing. And in glass, otherwise we use it really to make glass really clear, which is what we need if we want to shoot laser through it, or if you want to have internet cable and you want data to travel through it. It makes, um, before they used cerium, glass was very kind of green, there was a lot of iron in it, and it really is used as a purifying agent, and it's quite important for the industry that way. So I think like it goes more into clarifying than it goes into polishing. Or there's a lot of polishing happening around around the world for optical operations, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think like safety in a lab is uh, much more considered than in a glass studio. Um, I think actually like having the whole pandemic going on has been a really good benefit to a lot of glass artists because we have to be more careful and wear masks all over the place when we work with powders. 
generally, I worked in a, um, in a glass studio where the city came in and put these snorkels over our shoulders and we got these little devices that would record what off gases because you a lot of the colors that we use like for example white you can smell it every color has a different smell which means that when you melt it then it has a uh, it, it burns off something and so they were testing if what comes off of it is going above the standards of what's considered safe and it wasn't um, there is every studio we have very strong ventilation and for example if you want to work with glass powdered glass that's colored you only do this under ventilation hoods if you use silica sand you have to wear a mask when you make molds for example that's plaster silica I think everybody in the glass studio is more concerned about silica than they are concerned for example about the amounts of of cerium that you could inhale but you always try to protect yourself. And I think a lot of uh, glass artists, me included, have a lot of allergies that are directly linked to the materials we use. Like I'm allergic to um, resin and plastics. I'm also allergic to all metals. And that comes straight from me working in the studio. I think, and the US is um, much better equipped ventilation-wise than any other place I've ever worked at. <laughs> so I think here we are as safe as we can be. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you so much for this incredibly rich presentation. I think your work is so exciting. Thanks. Um, the reference to um, Exxon reminded me of um, Amitav Ghosh, you know, has this very famous essay where he says that, you know, oil is so <clears throat> central to the 20th century, but it doesn't really enter the culture, right? Yeah. It's like this weird invisibility. And then seeing your work and thinking about, like, if you're in a rare earth age, um, one of the things that I've been struggling with in conceptualizing my work is that there's very, very few images of mm -hmm. earth mining. Yeah. And it's like, you know, considering how much discourse there is, mm -hmm. like there must be someone that's doing this work, and it seems like there really isn't. So your work feels like it's addressing um, a really interesting gap. So I guess my question is, you know, are there sort of other artists who are working in and around these issues? And then maybe what, um, what working with glass might allow us to like learn about rare earth that something like a photograph might not. Yeah. There's something about that medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean we, we do in glass we use it so directly, right? Like we are so dependent on the mineral market and our costs rise and fall with all of that like for example right now my my partner is in poland and because of the war in ukraine he can't get any four and three millimeter thick sheet glass anymore because it's produced in russia and they don't deal with russia anymore and a lot of these things really immediately have impact on what we can do and if you're in the middle of a project that's huge um but um in terms of other artists that work with it i think there is an enormous lack of looking at mining as something that concerns us in particular as being from one of the eight countries that use most of it. Um, but there, I found a group, and I can give you the contact. Um, I don't right now remember their name. There is a group in England, though, that actually broke into the mine, in, the Bayanobo mine, and they went to this uh, toxic mining pond and extracted soil clay from there, and then they made these vessels out of it, which is a vessel that has the size to hold the amount of resource it would take to um, manufacture different sizes of computers. So they have these really nice ornate black vessels and they also made a big video uh, project with that but those are the only artists that I found that deal specifically with mining. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I, I love the, um, the model of your sculptures. Yeah. Really, both very beautiful but also really thought provoking. So yeah, thank you. Fantastic work. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm always interested in how, thank you. <laughs> um, sure. No, thank you for having me. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Yeah, it's been, it's been really interesting working with you through this project. And I was looking at your past work last night on your website, and it was really, I'm always interested in sort of how themes go across mm -hmm. an artist's body of work. And um, when you, I wondered if you could talk about the, you, you briefly mentioned on a technical level the pulling of glass in that furniture piece. Mm -hmm. And I recall something about that being um, uh, 
shape, the shapes of furniture that no longer existed or were being sold at a sale. The reason I'm asking is that it seems like part of your overall project is this question of, you know, what is extraction? Where does it go? And then the allure of the extraction and the colors, et cetera. And then a kind of rehoming of that back to its origin, mm -hmm. you know? And so there's something here about like replacing or emplacement of the extracted thing back to its origin story and kind of taking mm -hmm. us through that circle. And there's something kind of, um, domestic or like wh what is the home what is the adventures for extraction space and then that loops back I don't mm -hmm. know, could you talk yeah that i mean way? i think I think that's stringing a lot of things together in a way. For this project, it's certainly true that there is me kind of looking at that continuous loop yeah. um, of how things come to be what they are now and where do they come from. And I think that theme ties into my work, my larger body of work, which is about, um, that gets too long now to really talk about that very much, but it, I am born as an East German in communist Germany and losing my country, also having two currency changes, growing up in a system in which I had 13 years of Russian in school and having parents that lost everything. They, when we got new currency after the war, felt that you had 1,200 demark that you could keep and the rest was cut in half in the currency change. So everybody started at zero and just starting at zero and then redefining yourself has defined the way I work through my art making process of something being always very investigative and looking at what are what are sense what what is what are things that persist and what are things that change and finding finding comfort in change because it also opened up i grew up in an environment you know there was a lot of punk and anarchy uh, occupied houses my area of the city they started their own uh, republic within east germany and uh, printed their own currency and blocked off the streets and like living in an environment that was in such turmoil of course makes me do work that's investigative experimental I make my own rules. And that's the great thing as an artist, I get to make my own rules. But so a lot of the pieces that I do, it always goes back my work between being artwork that's very personal to me um, and then artwork that is kind of related to what I do, like the, the scientific processes come up over and over again. I keep doing residencies and projects that relate to science. Um, but it's also for me a bit taking a break from this other labor that's very personal and emotional and draining. I don't know how artists make a whole career of doing work that's extremely personal because that's re-exposing yourself to trauma, re-exposing yourself to things that are really hard. And then being able, you know, this is really a hard topic for me too, seeing how I am part of the destruction of our planet <laughs> and <laughs> then also celebrating it by, by being an artist, the most useless thing you can do, right? And it's like, well, there's this huge conflict of where do I fall on that spectrum? And even though this is really, um, this is really emotionally burdensome as well to do this research because you, you don't know what to do with the information you got in the end, but it's external to my personal life and dealing with these other themes. Like the piece that you mentioned with this, the, the glass cane that I made, it was all furniture that a woman had described on a Craigslist ad after leaving her husband after 25 years. And she was selling off all her furniture in New York and describing all of the emotional attachments and memories she had to each piece of this furniture. And it was during the pandemic when everybody's relationship was falling apart, including my sister's. <laughs> After 17 years with her partner, she left him. And so like I and my best friend was leaving and I felt like everybody was leaving their partners <laughs> during the pandemic. And so that Craigslist ad really spoke to me how somebody was giving, getting rid of their whole life and then decided I would recreate all of her furniture. And I had somebody read, there's an audio piece with the furniture that reads out the Craigslist ad. Um, and talks about each of the pieces. So that was a really kind of personal and pandemic related response piece. I think like as an artist, you respond to what is around you and whatever you surround yourself with filters into your work. 
I have to um, strongly disagree yes. that being an artist is the most, one of the most useful things to do. Um, I think at their best, right, artists um, show us things that we don't necessarily want to see and help us see the world yeah. in different ways. I mean, it's true, but it also, it's like I get to play all day. <laughs> <laughs> and my contribution to society is play. <laughs> Um, but at this point, I am going to. Yes, thank you. Roger, but thank you so much. For thank you. And I, you will have more time. And well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, and today, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story of energy transitions and material persistence the persistence of objects, the persistence of sand, the persistence of pollution. And this kind of. Um, comes out of, it centers on a small but growing collection of objects and documents that we have here at the Science History Institute, um, connected to Velsbach um, Gas Lighting um, Corporation, that we've been gathering um, really over the last few years. And it's also connected to a digital exhibit that um, I've been working on, on um, the critical metals and the chemistry of light. And this is a partnership that um, I've been uh, working with the Center for the Sustainable Separation of Metals, um, Eric Shelter's uh, research group um, at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so that's in about a, a month or so, hopefully, you'll be able to see this on um, some of this material on Google Arts and Culture. Um, my talk today is going to, uh, I think, hopefully build on um, Charlotte's um, introduction as well, um, plus um, uh, touch on parts of um, the, the stories that um, uh, Anna has told as well. Um, so we're going to try and take you from um, Godolinite um, up to the Superfund site and the EPA. Um, I'm going to start fairly well rooted in sources, I hope. Uh, and just a warning, it's going to become increasingly casual as we get to things that I just learned on Wednesday when um, Christy and Anna and I went and toured um, the Velsbach, um, what's, what's left of the Velsbach factory um, across the river in Gloucester, New Jersey. Okay, so my story begins um, in a chemistry laboratory at the University of Virginia in the early 1880s. There, doggedly studying the rare earth elements, is an unpaid laboratory assistant named Carl Auer. Now, I'll confess I'm romanticizing his circumstances um, a good bit here. Yes, he was unpaid, um, but he was the son of a minor nobleman, and he'd done his PhD with Robert Bunsen, one of the most distinguished chemists in, the and in Europe at the time, so he was uh, not real precarious. Um, and we now understand um, the rare earth elements that we understand that they get their unusual magnetic and optical properties from the structure of their electron shells. But that electron structure also means that they have very similar chemical um, properties. So they're challenging to separate and to identify. But back in the 1880s, it was just known that rare earth elements were difficult to isolate, poorly understood, and not yet useful for industrial applications. So Auer took up the challenge of separating the rare earth elements in 1880. He showed um, that didymium, which was then thought to be an element, was in fact an alloy of two rare earth elements. He named, he named them neodymium and praseodymium. And decades later, in 1907, he again made two elements um, uh, out of one when he managed to separate the element that we now know as lutetium out of a sample previously thought to be pure ytterbium. But between these two um, epic scientific discoveries, Auer made himself a fortune and became an Austrian baron, Karl Auer von, Vels von Velsbach, by turning his attention to industrial concerns. He became the first person to develop a commercial use of the rare earth elements. Um, so Velsbach recognized that the rare earth elements glowed incandescently when they were heated. Perhaps they could be used um, to produce lights that were cheaper and longer lasting than candles and lamp oil. So his plan was to make an incandescent gas lamp by combining a Bunsen burner from his mentor with a mantle. And the mantle was a cotton net um, that was impregnated with a solution containing dissolved metals. And when the net is heated in a gas flame, the cotton eventually burns away, um, leaving a solid, albeit somewhat fragile um, ash mantle, which glows brightly when heated. And if you want to see one of these in person, we have um, a variety of, uh, we, have, we have one um, back there along with several of the other objects that we have on, uh, in our new collection. So they'll be available through lunch. So excited to actually get a chance to see these physical objects in person for the first time. So this is, this is the gas mantle. Um, and in 1885, 
Velsbach started a company um, making mantles that used a chemical mixture of 60% magnesium oxide, 20% lanthanum oxide, one of the rare earths, and 20% yttrium oxide, another of the rare earths. But these mantles gave off a rather sickly green light that consumers didn't like, and uh, the company soon failed. In 1891, he tried again with a new formula. Um, this time using 99% thorium oxide and 1% cerium oxide. Now, radioactivity wouldn't be discovered for another five years, and the understanding of the dangers of mildly radioactive thorium would take much longer than that. But this new formula produced a much more attractive, uh, much more yellow light, and the, company, uh, and the new company took off. Uh, by 1935, more than 5 billion mantles had been produced uh, around the world and put to use. Now, as Velsbach's company expanded production, it competed to secure access to the mineral, monazite, from which it extracted thorium and cerium. And this sandy ore to supply these rare earth elements came largely from Brazil, India, and especially for the US factory, North Carolina, thus creating sort of the first international trade uh, in rare earth elements. So Velsbach set up factories in several countries, including Britain, um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and this one, pictured here just across the river um, in uh, Gloucester City, New Jersey. The factory was located on the Delaware River to make it easy to ship in the monazite ore, which was then processed on site. And at its peak, some 900 people were, worked at the factory, making it the biggest employer in um, Gloucester City. Many of these workers were women. They sewed cotton, dipped fabric in thorium solution, tested and dried and packaged the mantles. We can get something of uh, a sense of their work from this set of 46 postcards that were printed by the Velsbach company. Uh, and actually, we're, we're left with a little space uh, on the side here, which uh, ours, uh, the, our photographs don't, don't, or our postcards don't show this, but they would stamp on them, uh, a salesman will be coming to visit your store on, and then they left a blank where people could write in the date, and then they would mail these out to their various distributors um, across the country. So we can get kind of a sense of um, these postcards um, have a whole variety of images, um, 46 different images on them that cover the stages of production of the mantles, um, ranging all the way from the laboratory for the analysis of thorium minerals, as one of them puts it, through the sewing, collodionizing, hardening, trimming, uh, and packing processes. Now, many um, of these cards, like, uh, like this one, show exclusively women working in particular rooms, supervised by men. Uh, and a few of the cards show mixed gender workforces in particular aspects of the workflow. So the Velsbach company produced a wide range of promotional uh, materials to try and sell its system of gaslighting. This booklet was from about uh, 1889. Um, includes a depiction of the factory in Gloucester and several illustrations of the lighting system components, including mantles, burners, and air shutters. The booklet, I think, really emphasizes the ways that incandescent mantles were superior to previous gas lighting technologies. Velsbach claimed that, his, that its lighting system was cleaner burning, produced a more pleasant quality of light, and minimized, as, he, as they put it, the vitiation of the air. In other words, that it didn't consume so much of the room's oxygen uh, as it burned. And this may, I think, reflect an engagement with the rhetoric of uh, the fresh air movement of the time. So the company um, continued to make occasional health claims in its advertising by the 1920s. Uh, this is an advertisement from 1923. Uh, as gas mantles began to lose out to, electri to um, electric bulbs in the home lighting market, Felsbach tried a new tack. Um, this advertisement claimed that modern gas lighting offered health benefits by um, reading the atmosphere of dust and bacteria, while combustion, as they put it, set up a, a healthful circulation of the air inside of buildings. Whether that's true or not, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but more often, the Velsbach advertisements um, emphasize the quality of the light, suggesting that it was comfortable to the eyes, sort of bright but not glaring. Uh, and the company often presented tranquil scenes of middle-class domestic life, like those featuring uh, mothers uh, reading or embroidering. And this is a little um, tip tray. This is about, oh, this must be 20 times the size it really is. You can see it back there in the thing. It's about, it's about this big to be left kind of at a, uh, uh, at a counter for people to leave, to leave tips or sort of a take a penny, leave a penny kind of, um, uh, kind of object. 
Um, other ads were suggested that the how gaslight could be used in factories or in recreational sites like pool halls or saloons. But ads also tended to tout the economy of Velsbach products, highlighting how gas-powered incandescent produced more light using less gas um, than flame alone. Now, of course, um, Velsbach was far from alone in the lighting market. Different lighting technologies competed to light the streets, factories, and homes during the decades around 1900. Um, and the quest to find a long-lasting and affordable lamp that could produce a pleasant light drove research and experimentation with many metals that were then considered to be exotic. And this is just one of my one of my favorite ads. I just kind of stuck it up up here so to make sure it didn't uh, it didn't fall out of it uh, fall out of the presentation. But kind of a, a foreshadowing of of concerns about light pollution um, that we that we talk about um, now a century later. So, who are the competitors, of course, for um, for the Velsbach light? Well. Thomas Edison's carbon filament light had, of course, been the rage at the Paris Fair in 1881. And uh, Walter Nernst's um, electric glower, which is uh, this particular kind of um, interestingly shaped light bulb here, used uh, initially used a filament of um, uh, godolinite um, and only lasted two hours. But then an improved model with a filament made of yttrium and zirconium lasted nearly 700 hours um, somewhat later. And so, um, Part of the story of these competing systems of light is also a story of competition for supplies of the key metals um, that would be used. And so lamp makers competed for access to these kinds of unusual metals. Um, when godolinite was um, discovered atop Behringer Hill in Llano County, Texas in 1887, the yttrium it was known to contain was seven times more valuable than gold. And one of uh, Thomas Edison's companies actually paid $5,000 in gold to the lucky car carpenter who had received this hill uh, in exchange for helping to build a house. And he was like, I don't have any cash to pay you. Would you just like this hill? And he was like, okay. And it turned out to be a real, uh, a real bonanza for him. But um, after Edison's company experimented with all 47 of the unusual minerals that were found there, um, he moved on to other metals, while Nernst employer, Nernst's employer, Westinghouse, bought the hill, and it actually became the company's primary source for yttrium for its street lamps for a couple decades. But ultimately, it was tungsten rather than the rare earth metals that became the most common metal used in 20th century lighting. Metallurgy research um, at uh, General Electric led to um, the tungsten filament bulb um, which became increasingly dominant during the 1920s. And this is a photograph of a, of a light bulb that we have down on display in, our, uh, in the museum, which you can see this afternoon. Um, tungsten alloys produced a glow that consumers found pleasant. Um, it was nice light. But perhaps more importantly, the production and supply chain for tungsten metal um, was already really well established, since it was essential to the production um, of steel in much, much larger volumes than it was ever needed for lighting. So after the triumph of electrical lighting, Behringer's Hill became just another forgotten spot in the Texas Hill Country. In 1938, in fact, it was submerged under 100 feet of Lake Buchanan water after a dam was built for irrigation and to control flooding. Now, the Velsbach Company also went underwater, though uh, mostly financially rather than literally. The factory in New Jersey um, was closed by the early 1940s. Uh, and the site on the Delaware River became a Navy storage depot during World War II. After the war, it was redeveloped as a port. And today, right there in the shadow of the Walt Whitman Bridge, um, it has the largest refrigeration capacity of any cargo terminal on the East Coast. It's a major logistics hub uh, for the fresh food trade, um, supplying us perhaps with some of the things that we'll be eating in our lunch today. OK, so let's flip back. Um, to the thorium that Velsbach used um, to explore the half-life of, of gas mantles here in my metaphor. <clears throat> so the Velsbach factory became a major site for the production of radioactive materials in the United States from about uh, 1917, 1918 uh, into the 1930s. Extracting thorium and um, cerium from the monazite left behind a huge pile of waste sand which, as it turns out, was radioactive. And the company was really interested to try and find 
a way to monetize this waste, right? Both what, how do we get rid of it, but also can we make some money off of it? The, for sort of the perpetual story of chemical engineering. Um, and uh, in 1917, Harlan S. Miner, who was um, the chief chemist for Velsbach gas, Gaslight in the United States, was connected through the US Bureau of Mines. So again, we have a, we have a government science story. Um, was connected to Hermann um, Schlund, who was a chemist at the University of Missouri, who had developed a method for separating radium from the waste. Uh, in particular, he, he was able to separate out um, the isotope radium-228 which um, Schlund and Miner came to call mesotherium, uh, sorry, mesothorium. So sometimes when you're, you know, it's the, the connections to radium aren't always obvious because they're often hidden behind this term uh, mesothorium, which took me a while to work that out. So now you know. Um, so soon, Velsbach um, became a kind of key supplier of thorium and radium to both researchers as well as manufacturers uh, in the United States and around the world. Radium from here goes um, uh, kind of uh, up th uh, north into New Jersey um, to Orange, New Jersey, where the company US Radium is using it to um, create watch dials that glow in the dark. And this is the story, it's a fairly familiar story in the history of science of um, the radium girls, right? Of uh, the women who are painting on uh, this radioactive paint, licking their paintbrushes, getting all kinds of, all kinds of cancers from uh, the, the, um, the consumption of radiation. So that's, that's part of, you know, this, this story of Velsbach gas lights helps to start to map out the flow of radioactive materials around the United States um, prior, to, uh, prior to World War II. Now, um, Harland Miner is also, and I really wish I could find a picture of him, but I have not yet found one. So if anybody has any ideas where to look, um, I'd appreciate it. But Harland Miner is also connected to Marie Curie as well. Uh, this is a letter from the Lehigh University archives where he describes uh, meeting Marie Curie um, and what she was like as a person. Um, so he met, he met Marie Curie when she actually made a secret visit to the Velsbach factory in 1921 as part of a very highly publicized, very public tour of the United States when the women of America presented, um, presented Marie Curie with one gram of pure radium. Um, and um, this is a time when she is, uh, when Curie is uh, increasingly unwell, she's tired and run down, and she really limits her social engagements. Um, so her daughters stand in as surrogates for her on many, in many of her events, but she's clear that she wants to go and visit the Velsbach factory personally and um, talk with um, uh, Harlan Miner. Okay, so we'll, I'll kind of come here now to talk a little bit about the afterlife of Velsbach gas lights. Um, and this is really, um, again, things that we just learned, uh, we, that um, just learned on Wednesday from conversing with and, uh, and meet, getting to meet the people at the EPA who are leading this, uh, the, the cleanup um, at the, the former Velsbach factory. So one of the things that was really surprising and, and fascinating to learn is that um, the radioactive sand left behind um, at the Velsbach factory, left over from the extraction of thorium and cerium, makes an ideal fill material. Uh, and so people around Gloucester would go and take shovelfuls or barrelfuls or, um, or uh, wagonfuls of this sand uh, and use it to, to level out their basements or kind of sub-basements before, before pouring a concrete basement. They used it for filling in wetlands. They used it for leveling new land or leveling land for new development. And they used it for creating new land in the Delaware River. Um, this, the, the former factory site became a Superfund site um, in, the, uh, in the 1980s. And since that time, the US Environmental Protection Agency and the Army Corps of Engineers have spent more than $300 million removing radioactive soil and monitoring the groundwater flows here. And some of the people, this is, this is a photo, this is a, uh, a news photo from from uh, from 2017. But some of the people that we met here have been working on the site for for 20 years. They kind of are likely to spend almost their whole career, or perhaps their whole career in the EPA, working on this particular site. Um, but the origins of this site and the radioactivity of this site was um, not discovered, you know, in the way that um, 
uh, in the way that Love Canal was by the experience of toxicity, but it was kind of discovered through um, historical research and background research on the US radium site, the, the um, uh, originally. They discovered uh, people working there at the cleanup at, the, at that site in Orange, New Jersey, found receipts from the Velsbach factory, and they said, <laughs> what's this? Where did this come from? This is where apparently the radium is coming from. So they, they started to sort of track back from that. Um, and then uh, they kind of went through an, uh, an aerial survey. And I'm sorry, this is not the, a, super clear, uh, a super clear image, but they did um, sort of an initial, an initial aerial survey to start to find out where the radioactivity was around, uh, around um, Gloucester. Uh, and at one point, apparently one of, the, uh, one of the people discovered a whole new area that was not thought to be contaminated before um, because they, were, they took their Geiger counter with them when they went to lunch and it was sitting on the floor of the car and it just started going off as they were driving through uh, one of these streets. Um, but one of the things I think was really interesting in talking with um, the EPA uh, at managers at this site is the way that they used historical documents to try and understand and guide their cleanup here. So historical documents helped them to understand where the contain where the cont radiological contamination might be found. So they were looking at things like the Sanborn fire insurance maps, uh, NOAA depth charts um, for for that mapped out kind of the changing depths of the the river, uh, as well as historical maps of new buildings. So this is a really unusual kind of Superfund site in that it's not sort of, uh, as, as uh, one of the site engineers put it, it's not a central hotspot where then the, the contaminants sort of spread out naturally through groundwater or through, um, um, uh, you know, or, or through windblown dust. Um, but this is, a, this is a, a site where people kind of picked up the sand and redeposited it in very specific kinds of places. So the kinds of places where they've been finding this, they find it in basements, they find it made into bricks sometimes. Uh, and in fact, in the, when they were uh, remediating an old swim club, they actually found these radioactive um, gas mantles like embedded into the walls as part of the, um, made into the cinder blocks. And one of the things that they pointed out as well is that there's very little known about the human health impacts um, here. And so that was, that was a question that, that Christy and, and Anna and I kind of kept asking was like, who's, you know, who's been harmed here and to what extent have people been, been harmed by this radiation? And it was, there's, it's, uh, it's not very well known, uh, at, at least at this point. Um, we also got a chance to tour one of these sort of huge cavernous buildings. Um, that uh, that was formerly part of the part of the factory, um, and uh, so they were kind of fascinating to, to look through. Um, as as the the EPA's um, project manager put it, we've Swiss cheesed the building, so there's more than 2,500 um, uh, bore boreholes to figure out where its radio where radioactivity is, and um, that's uh, that's Anna pointing to a tiny. Um, stalagmite that is beginning to grow where um, water has dripped through has dripped through this uh, largely this basically abandoned building uh, and and eroded the concrete uh, and then finally I'm going to end with um, what was I think one of the real amazing things this is what's called the bird room so um, most of the windows had been blocked up uh, in this building uh, there were lots of lots of windows at kind of at, at eye level to provide um, to provide natural light when it was working as a as a factory, and then they were brick, bricked up when it was converted for a while as cold storage for food. Um, but where the windows have broken, um, birds have broken. Birds have come in and and roosted there. And they, when they began remediation here, they had to kind of scoop out 18 inches of guano um, that um, had actually taken up the radiation out of the concrete in the floor. Uh, and so that all was then packed into 55-gallon drums and sent off to a secure um, radiological disposal site in Texas. Um, so I'm just going to end with um, a little reflection that in addition to industrial sites, the afterlife of these gas mantles is also an intimate history of personal objects. Right? And so one of the, the things that we have back in the case there is a Velsbach, um, uh, the middle um, frame for a, a gas lamp that has then been converted to electricity, right? So somebody 
somebody valued this object enough to, during an energy transition from, uh, from gas to electricity, to actually convert this lamp uh, into, to enable it to kind of continue its function even in a new energy regime. So I think it's kind of interesting that this is a story of industrial sites as well as homes and beloved objects. And I will leave it right there. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. That was so interesting, and I really appreciated that you um, kind of took us through time in that way to think about the afterlife, and it followed up so nicely from some of the questions about toxicity. Um, so we are running a little bit behind schedule, so I do think this panel will probably go until about 12.10, if that's okay with everyone. But we do have one last panel on for afternoon panel, so we will okay. eventually get back on that. Um, so we have about like, five or seven minutes for questions, if anyone wants to start. Same. Yeah, um, this was great, and it and it gives a good prelude to uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, in the afternoon. But I'm wondering, like, uh, timeline-wise, when did uh, the Wellspec factory uh, close, or like, when did the company go bankrupt? And uh, was there any sort of like, did the company try to? try to pivot to anything else, because I'm going to be talking about another company that, that made a successful pivot for a while, but I'm, I'm, wonder, I'm just wondering, like, uh, what happened with Wellspot? Yeah, so I don't know exactly when the factory closed, and that's one of the things that's on my list of things to find out next. Um, they did try to make a make make pivot. So there's advertisements showing that they that they went into producing um, radiant gas heaters, and so other kinds of um, products that would use that would use the gas infrastructure um the it's cl clear that the company was bought out by someone um that uh, another company that then that then carried on um and so some of the connections to lindley chemical who i know you're you've been interested in um and then there's another company that that ultimately makes a settlement um that provides a great deal of the money for the initial for the initial cleanup funds um in the 1980s um, that's some descendant of that of that company, um, and Velsbach himself also tries to um, uses his chemical expertise to to try and develop and and his uh, engineering skills to try and develop uh, an alternative light bulb, uh, an alternative electric light bulb. And so there's some ads out there for um, street like a uh, uh, stoplight that uses a that uses a different a different filament. Um, and so there's some effort there. I, I don't think that's ever particularly commercially successful. Um, like one thing to add to this, maybe I'm, that's just a guess. But when we were out at the site, we learned that the he, the call our from Wellsbach, never came to the U.S. He lived in Austria and he built his company here, and he never. But maybe for him, it was. Just, I mean, he was dead at that point. But so maybe there was just not enough. Like okay, you know, maybe there was not enough interest for a guy that had no ties after his death to this uh, country. And so that was really interesting for me to learn that this factory was still on somebody from abroad that, that was very remote involved. But my question to you, Roger, was that I uh, bought one of these gas mantles myself because I wanted to like have one touch them, figure out what they do, and eventually probably embed them in some glass. But um, I also figured out that Coleman camp stoves, uh, Coleman camp lights, like Coleman camping lights, you buy mantles for them as well. Mm -hmm. And they also burn into this uh, hard shell and they look exactly the same, just a slightly different shape. Do you know that they have anything to do with the Wellsbuff patent, the Wellsbuff mantles? I don't, but I would love to. Would love to find out. I think that seems like a really interesting, yeah, sort of a continuing that, that story. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they may well, they may well be the sim very similar. Although I have a hard time imagining that anybody would want to use thorium <laughs> now yeah. these days. Yeah, because I was also wondering what's in them now. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I don't know if this would be of interest to you, but when I was a kid in Iran, we had uh, solar panels, and we had blackouts. So we use these. <clears throat> as lights. Uh -huh. Every house has uh, natural gas, so they exist, and I think they're still present in some parts of the world. Uh -huh. so that's great. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
very interesting. Well, good. I think you can follow the green. Make the story very rich. Great. My mom's yeah. house actually has one on the wall. That's what's so functional. What was it? What was it like to to light it? And and is the is the, was the light pleasant? So, is it? So you have to be careful when writing homework not to hit them because they shatter. Uh, once they're lighted, like you touch them, they shatter. But the replacement is easy, and Christopher, I can bring some replacement. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. that would be that would be amazing to add those to to add those to the collection. The, the new ones, but they look identical to that. Huh. Neat, neat, neat. My name is Gustav Lester. I'm a, a doctoral candidate in the Department of the History of Science at Harvard and a, and a, dis a, a dissertation fellow here at the Science History Institute. Um, I'm also very pleased to be the chair of our afternoon panel. Um, I'm going to be uh, starting us off again uh, like this morning with a, a round of introductions of our speakers um, and our, of our panelists, after which uh, they'll have about roughly 20 minutes or so to speak, followed by about 10 minutes of Q&A, and I'm going to ask them to, to uh, field their own questions, but I will remind them of the time once we approach, approach that. Um, unfortunately, as uh, some of you may already be aware, one of our panelists for this afternoon had to cancel, uh, Ingrid Burrington, um, uh, which we're very uh, uh, sad about that. Um, and, uh, um, but again, I do want to encourage everyone, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to uh, speak up during the Q&A. Um, we did uh, shuffle the, uh, the order a little bit, so Maddie Stone will be kicking us off this morning, or this afternoon, um, because of technical issues this morning. Um, and you already heard a little bit about her career as a uh, science environmental journalist this morning. Um, we we'll also have Siobhan Angus, who is a, a Haas short-term fellow at the Science History Institute. Her cur current research explores the visual culture of resource extraction, with a focus on materiality, perceptions of nature, and environmental justice. She's currently a Bonting postdoctoral fellow in, uh, in the history of art at Yale University and an incoming assistant professor of communication and media studies at Carleton University. Her monograph, Camera Geologica, is forthcoming with Duke University Press. Zane Cooper is a doctoral candidate at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, doctoral fellow at the Center for Advanced Research in Global Communication, and his dissertation, Bitcoin Rare Earth, Data Energy and Extraction Across the Arctic is a multimodal and multi-sided ethnographic study of the entangled material practices of data, energy, and extraction in and between Iceland and Greenland. And finally, um, uh, we have Eric Schalter, who is a professor of, of chemistry at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also the director of the Center for Sustainable Separations of Metals, which aims to reduce the waste and energy consumption of metal supply chains through new knowledge in metals separations chemistry. Um, in the Shelter Lab, researchers pursue projects addressing the sustainable production and recycling of rare earth metals from end of life materials, including consumer products like cell phones, laptops, and batteries. He'll be speaking today um, about rare earths as an object lesson in critical metals challenges. Um, and, uh, I would, and so with that, I'd like to um, invite Maddie Stone to please kick us off. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, to the organizers for putting this together. It's been really cool. So today I'm excited to talk briefly about one of the, techn um, one of the topics that fascinates me the most as a science and environmental journalist, and that is metals and the clean energy revolution. And um, while the specific focus, obviously, of this symposium and my talk will be on rare earths, you'll see throughout my talk that a lot of the lessons from rare earths um, apply to a broader class of resources, sometimes called critical minerals or critical materials, that humanity needs in order to transition to a low carbon economy and that are going to largely drive the geopolitics of resource extraction in the 21st century. So we heard a lot about the history of rare earths this morning. Now I'm going to take us about five minutes into the future. Um, and this on the title slide is a NASA image of Greenland, which I just threw up there because I think in a lot of ways Greenland sort of epitomizes the tension at the heart of the clean energy revolution when we talk about rare earths and critical minerals. Um, Greenland, as I think everyone knows, is home to Earth's second major landbound ice sheet, one that is melting and retreating rapidly due to climate change and driving up sea levels in the process. So the impacts of climate change in Greenland are very profound and are being felt globally. 
Um, Greenland is also um, less known for the fact that it is home to a potential climate solution. It um, contains sizable deposits of rare earth elements, metals we need in order to build several of the different clean energy technologies that are going to be critical to transitioning off fossil fuels and fighting climate change, and controversy over the possibility of expanding mining on Greenland in order to extract these rare earths has really dominated the island's politics over the past year because, yes, there are people who live on Greenland too, and extraction there matters to them. And so I just wanted to sort of set the stage with that um, to get you thinking about this tension between the resource needs of the clean energy revolution, the fact that it is very much a material revolution, and the fact that there are going to be challenges and tensions that arise when it comes to the actual localized and um, very place-based extraction of those resources. So as I was just saying, um, a key fact about the clean energy revolution that remains, in my view, surprisingly under-discussed in the media and um, even perhaps less well-known to the general public is that it's really a metals revolution. So the devices that we need to run modern civilization off the wind and the sun and electrons are high-tech devices. So we talked about iPhones this morning. You know, just like the iPhone you might use or the TV in your living room, um, which requires elements uh, comprising about half the periodic table in order to function properly, wind turbines, solar panels, electric vehicle batteries also require a host of specialized metals and minerals um, from across the periodic table and across the planet in order to function. So solar panels, as a quick example here, the underlying technology is based on silicon wafers that harvest sunlight, convert it to electricity. So you now need refined silicon, but you also need significant quantities of copper um, used in the wiring, aluminum to create the framing of the solar panel. And then modern solar technology also relies on smaller but still significant amounts of things like silver, lead, tin, gallium, germanium. And um, while an individual solar panel might not use much of any of these metals. When you look at the scale and speed with which we need to build solar panels globally in order to fight climate change, these amounts become quite significant. And so it's a similar story with wind technology. Wind turbines are these massive skyscraper-sized structures that use huge amounts of structural steel made of iron in the tower, as well as copper and aluminum. They also have these multi-ton fiberglass blades made of specialized materials, and they require a number of more specialized metals to produce electricity. And in particular, the wind industry is becoming a really major driver of global rare earth demand. So as turbines get larger and more powerful, particularly as we move more to offshore wind turbines, which can harness um, maybe 10, 20 megawatts of power each, um, we're shifting away from older technologies that were based on rotating gearboxes toward what's called direct drive wind turbine technology that uses these powerful neodymium iron boron magnets in order to drive a generator. And so um, if you think about rare earth magnets, maybe in a smartphone context or in the context of your laptop computer, um, very similar to those magnets, except now supersized. So we're talking about magnets that use potentially hundreds of pounds of rare earth metals each, as opposed to the fraction of a gram used in the speakers inside your smartphone. And um, maybe the best known example of how the clean energy revolution is a metals revolution, it's just gotten a little bit more attention in the press, particularly recently, is uh, lithium ion battery technology. So lithium ion batteries power, of course, consumer devices, but they also power electric cars and the even larger batteries that we're starting to put on the grid in order to store uh, wind and solar energy for when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. So the batteries inside an EV and the ones being used for grid storage are, again, you can sort of think of them loosely like a giant version of the battery in your phone. They require significant quantities of lithium, as well often as things like nickel and cobalt, um, graphite, manganese, and more. Um, in 2015, just um, to give you just sort of a sense of how things are changing, EVs and battery storage actually surpass consumer electronics to become the largest consumers of lithium. And together, uh, EVs and battery storage account for about 30% of global lithium demand today, and that number is growing rapidly. Um, also important to note and of interest to this room, hybrid and electric vehicle motors contain rare earth magnets. 
smaller than the ones I was talking about in the wind turbine context, but still containing often upwards of a kilogram, so about two pounds of rare earths each. And when you look at projections for the number of electric vehicles that are going to hit the roads this decade, we're talking hundreds of millions of new cars in the years to come, and um, even more in the decades to come as we move to electrify the global transportation fleet. This is, again, a significant amount of demand in the pipeline. And so looking across an even wider range of clean energy technologies, I'm sorry, this is not the, the prettiest graphic, but I just threw it up there to illustrate that uh, metals and minerals play an important, if not essential, role in virtually all clean energy technologies in play today. So whether we're talking about solar or wind or hydropower, geothermal, nuclear, hydrogen, and of course, very importantly, we can't forget the transmission networks that need to be vastly built out in order to bring all of these low and zero carbon electrons to our cities and our homes in order to replace the fossil fuel grids of today. So this is a chart um, that the International Energy Agency put together last year. It put out a big report on critical minerals and the energy transition. And if you're interested in this topic broadly, I highly suggest checking out that report. It's um, about like 80 pages long, but it's very written in very lay-friendly, digestible language. And so the chart just shows critical mineral needs for various clean energy technologies. And you can see that uh, pretty much all the technologies on the list require um, something or other that is considered a critical mineral. And so what does the metal intensive nature of the clean energy revolution mean? It means that a rapid transition to clean energy is going to lead to a surge in demand for metals and minerals across the board. So this graph also from that IEA report last year shows expected total growth in mineral demand by the clean energy sector under different climate policy scenarios. And um, in 2020, the global clean energy sector ate up about 7 million tons of minerals. So that's everything from lithium to rare earths under what's known as a stated policy scenario. So that's where nations of the world meet their current stated commitments to reduce carbon emissions in order to fight climate change under the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, that mineral demand doubles by 2040. So that's aggregate global mineral demand. But very importantly, stated climate policies are not enough to drive the rapid decarbonization that scientists say is needed in order to keep global warming below 2 degrees Celsius, much less below the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold that science has recently converged on as potentially a very dangerous planetary threshold to cross if we want to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And so a scenario where we set more ambitious decarbonization targets globally in order to remain within those safe planetary boundaries is shown on the far right um, of the bar chart, so the, the rightmost two bars there. And in that scenario, by 2040, the clean energy sector's total mineral demand will quadruple compared with today. And the y-axis here just shows uh, total demand in millions of tons. And so um, just to give you a, a few more numbers to contextualize the scope and the scale of this, the uh, expected growth in mineral demand is going to be fastest for lithium and some of those other battery metals that I was talking about, things like cobalt and nickel. But after lithium and the battery metals, rare earths are one of the categories of minerals where demand is projected to rise most sharply. And so in that recent report, the IEA projected a seven-fold rise in global rare earth demand by 2040 under a sustainable development scenario in line with the Paris Climate Agreement targets. So seven times um, more rare earths are going to be needed by the year 2040 than are currently in use today. And um, just one other statistic that I found, a paper published in Nature Sustainability in 2019 looked at the US offshore wind industry, which is very, very tiny today but projected to grow rapidly in the years to come, and found that the, this single industry, so offshore wind in the US alone, could require 17,000 tons of neodymium by 2050. Um, that's not an impossible amount. Global production of that metal stands at around 30,000 tons a year. So um, it's, it's a doable amount, but the United States, of course, is not the only country that's betting big on offshore wind to help it meet its climate targets nor is offshore wind the only end user for neodymium. So 
what does all of this mean um, in a lot of people's minds, in a lot of politicians' minds, a lot of how it's framed up in the media, is that a mining boom is coming. So we saw some nice imagery of the Mountain Pass mine uh, earlier this morning in California. This is another photograph of that mine, the United States' only rare earth mine and processing facility. Um, after the company running the mine filed for bankruptcy in 2015, it, it reemerged and resumed rare earth mining several years later um, and has since become something of a sort of pillar of the United States political strategy to uh, reduce its reliance on Chinese supplies of rare earths. So I believe as of last year, I looked up the USGS statistics for this the other day, uh, Mountain Pass produced about 15% of the global rare earth supply. But that's a very new phenomenon, is, is the mine restarting. So China dominated the rare earth scene for a long time. The US is getting back in the game now. And uh, both the Trump and Biden administrations have taken an active interest in this mine and ramping up its processing capabilities even further in order to reduce our reliance on Chinese rare earths and Chinese rare earth processing. Um, the mining boom has attracted considerable media attention in recent months. Late last year, the New York Times launched this big investigative series called Race to the Future, looking at the geopolitics of critical mineral extraction needed for the clean energy revolution. This headline's from a feature they ran just last month on cobalt, which is one of the metals they've been focusing a lot of attention on. Cobalt extraction in the DRC, what that means for um, the political landscape there and tensions between China and the US and other major end users of cobalt. Uh, seabed mining is another area that's garnered significant interest from media and tech investors alike. So although this is a completely speculative industry right now, lots of companies and some countries are interested in developing technology to suck up what are called polymetallic nodules off the seafloor. These are these little potato-sized rock concretions that contain high concentrations of various critical metals, including nickel, manganese, and rare earths. And um, a number of startups and companies that are looking to get into this space are positioning this as a potential green alternative to expanding land-based mining. We can just, you know, in theory, suck up these little rocks that are sitting there on the seafloor and potentially supply a large fraction of our future demand for rare earths and other critical metals. Uh, on the other hand, environmentalists are warning that the ecological consequences of strip mining and ecosystem that we barely understand um, and have only just begun to explore could be disastrous and are calling for a moratorium on uh, global rulemaking when it comes to deep sea mining. So this is another area in which um, this tension between critical minerals and the um, desire to secure resources for our future is butting up against concerns over the environment. And as I mentioned at the outset, even Greenland has gotten caught up in the global minerals race. Again, um, the island contains sizable rare earth deposits. A number of country, uh, countries and companies have expressed interest in mining them. Last spring, the Democratic Socialist Party uh, won some key elections after campaigning on a promise to cancel a controversial mining project that um, could have become one of the world's largest rare earth mines. And last fall, the parliament passed a bill that would ban uranium mining and by doing so block that proposed rare earths project. And that's um, really a microcosm for something we're seeing play out around the world which is this front lines, often indigenous-led resistance to the idea of opening up new extractive frontiers in the name of clean energy. So we're seeing this tension emerge between old extractive capitalism, now with this sort of new green and climate-friendly veneer, and environmental justice and um, the needs and desires of local communities where mining is slated to take place. So just another quick example I've been closely following is a growing controversy over a large proposed lithium mine in northern Nevada called Thacker Pass, which is now the sub subject of a federal court battle uh, with a number of local Native American tribes suing the federal government, alleging that the Trump administration violated key environmental policy statutes when permitting the mine without adequately consulting them. So that's just um, an example of something we're starting to see play out worldwide. 
And despite pushback and resistance against new mining projects from frontline communities in the U.S., there appears to be a um, growing and somewhat surprising amount of bipartisan political support for more mining and for onshoring the supply chains of critical minerals to ensure that we have the resources we need in order to transition into a low carbon energy future. So in 2020, the Trump administration actually signed an order declaring a national emergency in the mining industry aimed at speeding up the permitting of new mines on U.S. soil. Um, again, in framed as a way to reduce dependence on foreign suppliers like China. Just last Friday, the Biden administration invoked the Defense Production Act to accelerate production of critical minerals, including rare earths in the U.S. So actually, very similar moves by both administrations. Um, this is just the latest in a broader strategy that the Biden administration has been working on for the last year to secure so-called Made in America supply chains for clean energy. And while this administration has promised to be more sensitive to tribal consultation, local community input, and environmental harm than its predecessor was, uh, many activists are quite nervous about these moves. So all of this sort of begs the question of, do we need to create green sacrifice zones in the name of clean energy? And if not, then what are the alternatives? And it turns out there are actually a number of alternatives that are starting to get more and more discussion. Um, a key one is recycling. So incre increased recycling is a big way to reduce demand for um, new mined metals for a really a bevy of critical minerals. So this graphic is from a recent report commissioned by Earthworks last year about electric vehicle battery metal recycling. It found that by scaling up recycling technologies that are currently at the laboratory or pilot scale, we could potentially shave nearly 40% off new cobalt demand and a quarter off new lithium demand by the middle of the century. Um, recycling is also going to be an important strategy in the rare earth space, where currently an unknown, I believe, um, there might be people in this room who can correct me on that, but likely very small fraction of rare earth metals are being recycled. Some of the biggest strides we've seen in rare earth recycling to date um, have been made in the consumer technology realm. So in 2019, this is uh, a feature I wrote for Gizmodo on Apple's efforts to reduce the amount of um, virgin mine material in its products by enhancing recycling. Apple actually staked out a goal in 2018 of ending mining altogether by closing the loop on all of the resources that go into its devices. Um, the story overall came out pretty critical on Apple and its progress toward that goal, but the company has made some small and notable progress in the years since. In 2020, Apple announced that its iPhone 12 would be its first phone to use 100% recycled rare earth elements in all of the magnets, including rare earths. Uh, we believe harvested by its iPhone recycling robots that are then integrated back into its upstream supply chain. And um, last year I wrote an article for Grist about some interesting efforts being led by Google and some other players in the hard drive space to recycle rare earth magnets inside hard disk drives in data centers. So data centers are a massive end user for hard disk drives which contain uh, neodymium magnets and there have been several recent academic studies estimating that the rare earth magnet stockpile in data center hard disk drives that are aging out uh, could be a major secondary supply feeding our future rare earth demand not just for consumer technology but also for clean energy if we can come up with efficient ways to harvest them. And a research team at Google is working at one of Google's data centers in Oklahoma in partnership with hard drive maker Seagate to um, come up with methods to collect, harvest, and reintegrate these rare earth magnets into its hard drive supply chain in kind of um, a large scale automated fashion. Um, beyond recycling, some people are thinking about ways that we could turn the existing toxic legacy of mining into a potential solution for the future. So across the United States, there are thousands of these coal ash ponds and waste sites filled with these uh, sooty toxic residues of coal extraction that need to be cleaned up. Um, and it turns out that 
certain types of coal ash and coal waste contain relatively high concentrations of rare earth elements. And if we could find ways to purify those metals out, we could potentially develop a new industry that helps remediate pollution zones and pay for the cleanup of these sites, which need to be cleaned up, um, while coming up with a new secondary supply of rare earths and helping meet future needs for these metals. So there's currently work being funded. I wrote about this again for GRIST last year by the US Department of Energy, along with several national laboratories and a consortium of universities around the country in order to improve the um, technology and find ways to bring it to market. A final strategy that's garnered significant discussion over the years is eliminating some of these critical minerals from future technologies entirely through material substitution and innovation. Um, broadly speaking, it's unclear at this point what the viable alternatives are for many clean energy technologies as the tech based on lithium, cobalt, nickel, rare earths has taken decades to reach maturity. But this is a conversation that's continuing under the Biden administration too. Um, so last year, the Department of Energy actually set a goal of eliminating nickel and cobalt from EV batteries in the future um, by moving to technologies that use other types of metals, maybe metals that are easier to source or that don't have um, the same uh, political or geographic constraints associated with them. And discussions about rare earth magnets and um, replacement or substitution have focused more on substituting some of the harder to get rare earths, um, like neodymium, with more common cousins like cerium. So that's research that's currently being worked on at national laboratories and elsewhere. Um, in the case of certain technologies like wind turbines, there's also discussion about moving away from rare earth magnet based technologies back to older technologies like those uh, rotating gearboxes I mentioned that don't require rare earth magnets at all. This is a table from that recent IEA report I keep referencing, um, also including a few potential future alternatives to the permanent magnet motors currently widely used for electric vehicles, including induction motors that don't require rare earths but use more copper and aluminum, or non-rare earth permanent magnets that might require more nickel and cobalt. It's important to note, and um, I think this is the final note I'll leave you with, that uh, substitution of these metals comes with its own trade-offs, not just in terms of performance or swapping one group of metals that need to be mined from the earth for another, but also over the long term trade-offs for mining communities where these industries are an established and important pillar of the economy. So I've talked a little bit about mining opposition. Um, but it is also important to note that many parts of the world are embedded in the mining economy. The quote here is from uh, Thea Rio Francos, a very smart political scientist I know who thinks about these issues carefully, reflecting on some of the trade-offs if the global EV supply chain were to move off cobalt as a way of uh, decoupling itself from some of the concerns about human rights and labor abu abuses tied to current supply chains in the DRC. So like all of these other solutions, eliminating a critical metal is an imperfect one that comes with its own set of thorny questions to answer. And um, that's all I wanted to share today. If I have a minute or two, I think I might have gone over time, but happy to take a question. <laughs> um, I have maybe one question that's been kind of on my mind since I started doing any of this uh, research. And it's like, can we even keep consuming at the rate we do? I mean, is, is that where the solution has to come from? Like, it's, yeah. it's no matter what solution we find to the current rate of growth that we have. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And I mean, a lot of people would say no. It's unsustainable. Um, it, it's, I think it's a little bit of an ideological question more than a scientific question. Some people, um, the tech optimists, will say, you know, we're going to find new energy sources that are going to make all of our problems go away. And other people say that we live in a world of constraint and we need to, like, learn to live within planetary boundaries. So that's a very big question. Um, 
most of the major reports that are uh, coming out on this topic that are driving political discussions, driving analysts' projections are based on sort of assumptions of business of, as usual in terms of global capitalism and growth and um, projecting future needs based on our consumption patterns and our lifestyle patterns today. But of course, that's another solution to talk about is do we all need a personal vehicle to get around um, and what are the implications of that for this metal consumption and these resource needs? And, you know, as you were saying in your talk this morning, um, and I thought this was really interesting statistic, the idea that um, such a large fraction of this, these metals are used by so few countries. And um, that raises all these implications for climate justice. Um, do we want the rest of the world to live American lifestyles in terms of consumption? And if so, what are the implications of that for the resources we're going to need? Um, or should we be thinking about ways in which to change our lifestyles and limit our consumption so that we maybe have more of these resources to go around for everyone? Yeah, I have uh, kind of a follow-up for this. Do you, are there any statistics out on if the pandemic with us stopping to move around so much, did that have any positive or negative? Because then we went all online and there was way more energy need in different yeah. places and more tech gadget need and like do we know is there any difference that that made there were some studies it was actually um so from from a carbon emissions perspective a lot of folks looked at this question in the early days of the pandemic and shortly thereafter and found a really steep but very short-lived drop in global carbon emissions sort of when those initial lockdowns started happening in april may of 2020 so I think that I, I could be wrong about this, um, but the number that sticks in my head is that global carbon emissions in April of 2020 were 17% lower than they would have been in the absence of the pandemic. But by the end of the year, those emissions numbers had completely rebounded. And so it was a very short-term result of um, the immediate pandemic response, people no longer driving to work, um, office buildings not needing to use electricity in the same way that they were. But you're right, some of that demand shifted to the home. Um, and I think questions about how that's going to play out over the long term are, are still being worked out. But the overall consensus is that the pandemic did not do much to um, reverse the uh, emissions and, and resource trends that we're on. Uh, in, in terms of uh, emphasizing short-term strategies, can recycling have, ever have more than a marginal effect in a situation where you're rapidly mm -hmm. ramping up the number of devices? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think the, the consensus among folks who've looked at this broadly speaking, so not just for rare earths, but this broad group of critical minerals I've been talking about, is that recycling is only going to meet a fraction of the demand, particularly as we're in this ramp up period. But the idea behind developing recycling technologies today and developing supportive um, structures in our society and our government to make recycling mandatory, to make it easy, to make it the norm, would be that, you know, 10, 20 years from now, when we're pulling millions of tons of first generation solar panels out of commission for the first time or decommissioning very large vol volumes of electric vehicle battery waste, is that by that time, those recycling solutions will be mature enough and available enough that we'll be able to really start closing these resource loops. So right now, the amount of waste generated by these clean energy industries is relatively, and I'm talking about the amount of um, end of life waste. So the amount of electric vehicle battery waste, the amount of dead solar panels, um, wind turbines is, is relatively small. So the recycling industry hasn't had to mature yet. Um, but we're now in a window of time where we need to see that industry rapidly mature in order to handle the volumes of waste that are coming so that recycling can play a pretty significant role in the future. And some of those statistics I put up there from Earthworks st 
study are on the optimistic side, but give you a ballpark sense of maybe we could be meeting a quarter of our lithium demand in 2040 by recycling batteries if we invest in those recycling solutions today. In that regard, mining other waste, like coal waste, sounds like a wonderful It's a really interesting idea, and um, one that has been quietly garnering support sort of across the political spectrum and also in some of these coal communities that um, have really seen um, their main source of livelihood dry up in recent years. Um, so there's folks at the University of Wyoming, um, big coal state, that are working on it, folks at the University of West Virginia. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting idea. And I just want to remind everyone that uh, you'll have time to ask more questions of our panelists during the coffee break and reception. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up here and invite uh, Savannah. I am not coming from a policy perspective, um, nor the science perspective that we'll hear earlier, um, but I'm an art historian. So today, I want to think a little bit about vision and cultural production and how that sort of fits into some of these questions. 10,000 digital images are scaled down in size, reduced to their base elements of chromatic value and density. Joan Foncuberta's Google Gram Neeps from 2005 recreates the first successful camera photograph for the digital age. In 1826 or 1827, the French inventor Nisifor Nieps captured a view outside his window using bitumen of Judea as a light sensitive material fixed on a polished pewter plate. Here, von Kuberta replaces bitumen with bits, bytes, and pixels. A Google image search for photo gathered the images, which were then input into a photo mosaic software. So the abstracted blocks of color and form materialize into a hazy pattern that forms the view from the window at Le Gras. And whatever the algorithm selected as representing photo becomes the base materials for the image. And in 1826, Niepce called his process the heliogram, sun writing. Francuberta renames the process the Googlegram, shifting attention from the autogenic power of the sun to the invisible work of the algorithm. But the photo is a digital C print, a chromogenic print, which is a process that spans the analog and the digital. So here we have a path traced from early chemical experiments that define photography to our pixelated present. And so today, I want to think through the symposium's core themes through a focus on C prints as a way of threading color, metals, and environment together. And this talk is somewhat related to my book project, Camera Geologica, which explores the chemical and material histories of photography as it connects to extraction. And at the root of my project is a simple and somewhat obvious premise that the mine is a necessary precondition for photography as a medium. Because since its inception, photography, both analog and digital, has relied on extraction. So silver, reduced to light sensitive silver halides, is by far the most important material. Throughout the 20th century, photography consumed an estimated 25% of silver produced. The image on the slide is an ad from Kodak of their famous silver vault. And the title on the slide comes from Kodak's Book of Film Care, which summarized that film is animal, vegetable, mineral. So I highlight this as a reminder that a wide range of mined materials have always been used to make images, even today when so many of our images are mediated by screens. So I want to turn to the digital to consider the extractive and visual image economies of our present and to um, crystallize these connections by picking up some of the themes introduced earlier today by really focusing on this question of environment. Um, so looking at where these color technologies and metals end up, in this case as electronics waste, and the environmental impacts of this. Um, but first, uh, what of the Google Gram's materiality? 
So the image is made from a digital file rather than a negative. But like in the analog print, light and silver halides are the key materials. So the print is made from three silver emulsion layers, sensitized to the primary additive colors of light, red, blue, green. The C print uses light absorbing inks in cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, a subtractive form of building color that yields a wide range of color when layered over a white substrate. In the digital process, lasers or LED lights are used to build the image. So here we get our first glimpse into rare earths. Finally, the print is run through chemical baths, which leaves a full color positive image. The CMYK process is an early form of color photography, which dates back to the three color method first suggested by the Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell in 1855, which led to the first color photograph in 1861. You can see in the image that silver emulsions are more sensitive to blues than other colors. This was fixed in 1880 when Hermann Vogel developed a process to make silver bromides sensitive to green, yellow, orange, and red, staining the emulsions with aniline dyes. The first commercially successful color photographic process, the Lumiere Autochrome, reached the market in 1907, and by 1935, Kodak launched Kodachrome. And today, the standard printing set still uses CMYK. And the composition of inks varies, but there are some generalizations that we can draw on. Cyan describes a range of blue-green colors, but typically the synthetic pigment copper thalocyanine introduced commercially in 1935 is used. Salothionine is also used as catalysts in fuel cells, in optical data storage, and solar energy technology. Um, and this, I think, connects to a point Maddie was making. Um, magenta was introduced in 1860 and is an aniline dye formed from coal tar. The second synthetic color, it marked the beginnings of a new chemical dye making industry. As the New York Times wrote, does it ever occur to Angelina as she floats magnificently down Broadway in all the luster of youth and fashion that the exquisite dress she wears is in fact dipped and steeped in the essence of vile, smoky, stinky, crackly English coal. Yes, frightful as it may seem, our wives and sweethearts are gradually becoming carboniferous. Coal, or rather coal tar, is the basis of all the colors now in use, such as mauve or magenta. And this um, colorful description points to the profound shift that the development of synthetic dyes had. In contrast to magenta, yellow has a very long history as a pigment, in which metals play a key role. Ochre is a natural clay pigment with iron minerals, while orpiment is a yellow arsenic sulfide. Turner's yellow and lead tin yellow are lead paints, while Indian yellow was said to be made from the urine of cows fed mango leaves. The bright, pure hues of cadmium yellow are formed from zinc sulfide, though, like lead, cadmium is poisonous. Today, diarylide yellows are the most common printer's ink. Um, so to summarize the digression into color, it's this interplay between silver halides, pigment, and light that forms the C-print. And metals play a critical role. But metals are also critical to the digital part of the process. As we've heard today, both digital cameras and smartphones use trace amounts of many different metals and minerals what Mackenzie Wark calls the mineral sandwich in your pocket. It is estimated that 80% of the stable elements in the periodic table are used in smartphones. And rare earths play an important role in mediating the image, so they're of particular interest to me. Lenses use lanthanum and yttrium, while the vivid colors on screen displays are also made from rare earths. Europium and yttrium make red, cerium yields blue, and terbium creates green. And these emit light at wavelengths that the human eye is sensitive to, forming the chromatic building blocks of the image. It is estimated that 8,750 tons of rare earth phosphors and pigments were used in 2012. And perhaps the display screen is the closest analogy to the print the surface or substrate that makes the photograph as an object, which seems to make rare earths a logical guide in this inquiry into mining and the digital image. However, this is complicated 
because rare earth mining rarely enters into the realm of visibility. The images on the slide are from a Reuters article in 2013. But while rare earths are widely discussed, there's very few images of them, especially in mining processes. Um, and this is done for a number of reasons. I mean, there's even less done by artists. The only images I can find are from news contexts. Um, so unusually for me, mining is not my focus today. And um, in light of this visual problem, I want to turn to environment to explore the material costs of mined materials in their eventual outcome as waste. So here, a discarded keyboard and other detritus are partially covered in soil. The scene could be a still from a post-apocalyptic film, an elegy for the remnants of a past society. The enigmatic and indirect image opens up the South African photographer Peter Hugo's book, Permanent Error, from 2011, which centers on Agboblochi, an Iwe stump in Accra, Ghana. In the second image, a tangled web of wires, circuit boards, and metals are inflamed. Dark smoke billows out of a bright, hot fire. Here again, the image is tightly framed, revealing very little about the scene around it. In the third shot, the camera reveals the wider frame. Soil fills the foreground as thick, black smoke pouring out of a number of fires merges into a flat, gray sky, framing a crowd of people. So Hugo situates us in an e-waste dump, where technologies are stripped down to base metals. At the dump, which spans 10 kilometers, young people, primarily 10 to 25 years old, break down old technologies and burn the plastic or rubber so metals can be separated and resold. Working without masks, gloves, or safety equipment, the work is done by hand or with makeshift tools found among the detritus. Electronics are the fastest growing portion of global garbage production, totaling an estimated 50 million tons of electronic waste per year. So in e-waste dumps, a different kind of mining is enacted. Here, the device itself is mined. Many of the most critical metals and minerals of the digital age, like rare earths, obviously cannot be separated using this method. Because there are methods for recovering these valuable elements, but they're both expensive and difficult. And while many countries have regulations on electronics recycling, the majority of electronics are improperly disposed of. In 2012, 206 billion was spent on consumer electronics in the US, but only 29% was recycled. The majority of electronics are sent to Africa, China, India, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Wholesalers purchase containers, which are typically labeled as secondhand consumer goods, not as waste. And from here, the electronics are broken down, stripped, and separated. Copper and other valuable materials are then resold. So this trade is illegal but tolerated. And in the decade since Hugo took these photographs, electronics production has rapidly increased. In two years between 2015 and 2017, the increase was 20%. Hugo's stark photographs attempt to make toxicity visible, emphasizing burning waste and acrid smoke. Here, a worker stares straight at the camera, framed by the smoke. Hugo's unsettling portraits are controversial, and they've been crit critiqued for their aestheticization of poverty. This is compounded by the power dynamics of a white photographer documenting the abject working conditions of black Africans for an art world audience. One of the troubling things about Hugo's photos is how the extraction of labor value finds a direct analog in the portraits. Anna Arvid and Kesson has shown how under slavery, the logic of exchangeability was linked to the corporealization of black lives, a value mediated by cotton as a material and a commodity that became read and visualized on the surface of individual bodies. So the visual economies of racial capitalism materialize lives as commodities. So these images become situated in a longer lineage that cast blackness as a sign of extractability. However, the literary scholar Kajitan Ihika has argued that despite the extractive dynamics in the image, Hugo's book brings scenes like this into a wider public consciousness, enabling a critique of consumption waste and the unequal toxic burdens that structure the global flow of materials. 
So the images consider the conditions of racial capitalism's environmental sacrifice zones, which encompass both extractive frontiers and the disposal of toxic waste. And planned obsolescence is revealed as a significant problem of environmental justice. And through Hugo's lens, this scene becomes out of time. The formal beauty of the subjects in the frame contrasts this hellish environment of smoke and fire, what curator Karen E. Milborn describes as a setting imagined by Goya. So the scene seems to draw from the extended temporalities of painting rather than the singular moment of the photograph. Here, a contrast can be drawn to another set of images by the Burkina Faso-born photographer Leon Madrego in 2008. Madrego's series, The Hell of Copper, is more photojournalistic. The dramatic framing and high contrast of the images is striking, but Rodrigo's are less aestheticized. Here, a male figure leans forward, his foot close to the camera, his face obscured. Beneath him are singed wires and attire. He leans to pick up scraps. The physicality of the back-breaking labor becomes visible, framed by the billowing smoke in the back and the charred refuse in the foreground. A leg spans the right side of the frame, adding to the impression of photojournalistic realism. In contrast, in Permanent Error, the square photograph's muted color range and use of visual repetition introduces seriality. They are obviously images intended to be created as art. And in Hugo's images, people are typically looking back at the camera, aware of the encounter. Widrego took some straight portraits, both, port both photographers captured Yaw Francis on the slide, Hugo's is on the left, but more often we see people at work. But in both projects, the photographs push the conventions of portraiture, staging an ecological encounter as the scene is immersed in a toxic haze. Widrego alludes to the complex reality of this place, describing his intention as not showing my images for what they depict, but for what they transmit namely the human and environmental cost of waste. Transmit conjures illusions of the network world of technology, but also of disease. It also points to some suspicions with representation and the value of representing places like this. Alba Broshi has dangerous levels of carbon monoxide, mercury, dioxin, cadmium, antimony, lead, mercury, thallium, hydrogen cyanide, PCBs, and chlorobenzenes. Some of these materials migrate into the particulate matter of smoke. Others enter into the soil, which drifts into toxic dust. Pollutants seep into waterways. So the toxic materials form heightened risks to people living in and around this place. But as toxins enter air, soil, and water, toxicity becomes hard to contain. In addition to its material realities, toxicity is also a problem of representation. It is largely invisible. While the smoke suggests the permeability of landscapes and bodies, in the photographs, we don't see how these materials enter into the lungs of workers who face serious health risks. Burns, headaches, respiratory problems, and nausea are immediate effects of exposure to toxic waste. But slow carcinogenic mutations give way to cancer and other industrial diseases. Toxins enter the food chain and become toxicants, increasing in concentration. So in the portraits, the human and ecological costs of the value extracted from the global majority to fuel the seemingly insatiable demand for technologies becomes unsettlingly clear. Here, the anti-black racism that Catherine Yusoff identifies at the heart of the Anthropocene is made visible, as the extraction of resources continues to be fueled from the extraction of energy from workers, or in Madrego's words, the garbage of the rich poisons the children of the poor. Here, three of these children are shown from behind, sitting on old computers. Beside them is a worn-out soccer net. The fire and smoke isn't present in the scene. The sky is blue. So the more quotidian framing shifts from Hugo's toxic sublime to a more contemplative but equally devastating indictment. As the demand for new technologies grow, the volume of data globally is expected to grow sixfold from 2015 to 2025. Addressing these environmental and political problems is urgent. 
Photographs are often viewed through screens and therefore seem to be dematerial. The imaginary of immateriality is crystallized in the framing of image software. Adobe's most popular editing program is Lightroom. Images are stored in the cloud. Here, our vision is redirected to atmosphere, not the dump or the mine. What are the implications of this reframing? With the digital image, the desire to transcend materiality and labor, woven through a photographic discourse, is seemingly attained. The conceptual shift from material object to dematerial representation, from the dark room to the light room, from the archive to the cloud, functions to symbolically neutralize the ongoing violences of extraction, hiding the environmental and human costs of the digital photograph. Thank you. Oh, I actually didn't know that history, but that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess in sort of thinking about like the incredibly kind of constitutive role that metals play in photography from its history, right? Silver being the most famous, but there's so many different materials that are used. But, you know, in creating the image, um, there's also, you know, like plants are a major source of extraction. Um, gelatin from kind of skin and bones of animals is also central to film emulsion. So also um, trying to think about metals but also sort of gesturing um, to the much broader extractive economies that also make these things possible. You know, not trying to isolate metals as the sort of only extractive economy in the image. Um, and then also when thinking about, you know, color, right, there's a lot of different um, materials that used in pigments, right? Some have kind of metal bases, but many of them don't. And um, it's always just such a striking you know, I feel like so much of photographic discourse in the same way that so much extraction sort of functions to make the object seem sort of transparent or invisible, right? So much photography, it's like a window into the world. So I'm always very interested in these moments in, say, advertising or something when corporations sort of make the materiality of it very visible or very tangible. And um, that sort of seems like always like an interesting tension um, in thinking about the image. I mean, in a similar way, Anna, your sort of work of um, sort of materializing this thing that we often hear about in discourse and very rarely enters into sites of visibility um, feels like a sort of interesting paradox that I like to sit with. Um, not really a question, but just a, a comment. Mm -hmm. I really liked how you connected the ideas of planned obsolescence and environmental justice. I feel like that's a, a connection that's not drawn very often. And um, something I think we really saw crystallized during the pandemic with mm -hmm. um, the growing, the, the exponential need we suddenly had for all these digital devices and the difficulty, you know, of finding them um, from primary suppliers, needing to get them secondhand, needing to repair old ones, and then facing all the challenges and barriers to repair. I think we sort of saw that um, problem of planned obsolescence firsthand. So thank you for making the environmental connection. Yeah, and in that, um, my research is really informed by discard study scholars um, who argue that, you know, the the only real solution is to start limiting production. And with so much technology, I mean, I have an iPhone 7 that is just like really holding on for dear life. And, um, you know, it worked fine until a certain software upgrade and then things just sort of stop working. So I know that there is kind of so much, um, you know, it becomes very difficult, right, not to feed into the cycle. And those are kind of like much larger structural questions. So I also sort of appreciate um, sort of policy dimension as well because, you know, I mean, I think like vision and visibility are really important questions for thinking through, um, you know, how we how we come to understand things, what we value. But there are these sort of dimensions that are only really addressed in sort of policy or science. Um, so it's really interesting to see a sort of interdisciplinary discussion today because 
like we can get at um, some more complex questions than we might in silos. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about the sort of the politics of who's allowed to take photographs mm -hmm. in the, in the like the in the the, the places the uh, metal recovery or environmental or e-waste disposal that you are that you are showing there. Because I mean, one of the challenges we we've, we've all been talking about is that um, you know for for rare earth production is that you're not allowed to take photographs in China <laughs> and, um, and or, you know, or there's real, there's real restrictions on who's allowed to take what kinds of photographs. Um, whereas that seemed to much more, much more open and, and uh, less, less restrictive here. But I wonder, mm -hmm. maybe I'm, I'm, I'd love to know more about kind of what, like who controls access and, or is access controlled at all? Um, yeah. I mean, that's such a great question. And, you know, my sort of book traces a kind of long history of mining photography. And this is a problem that surfaces you know, from the very beginning of photography. So that most mines are closed work sites and you cannot necessarily get access into them. And, you know, most people who do get access into mines are hired by kind of corporations or, you know, Timothy O'Sullivan's early photos of the geological survey. Um, but it's actually, you know, incredibly hard. Well, I mean, it's hard to get access and it's also hard to photograph any of these places. Um, and I feel like with rare earths, you know, you also have this problem of scale. So it's like both, um, kind of getting into that site, which, as you point out, in most cases are closed, but then even kind of making it legible is also incredibly difficult. And I mean, originally, um, when I started at the Science History Institute, my plan was to make my, like each of my chapters is centered on one mineral or metal, and my plan was to make my final chapter on rare earths. Um, but there's not really any photographs to work from, so it kind of posed a sort of structural problem that I've really been trying to think through. And I mean, I assume as uh, more rare earth mines kind of open up in North America and, you know, there's sort of um, incentive for companies to start circulating images, like lithium mining is heavily photographed. I think in part because it's very beautiful, right? It looks like green energy, even though it's quite destructive. So it's like some sites enter into visibility and other ones don't. Um, but the e-waste dump in Ghana, yeah, it's, um, it's a completely unregulated site. And so um, Wadrego goes in 2008, and then there's images published in National Geographic in 2009. And then um, Peter Hugo, who's quite a famous artist, goes in 2010. And it's sort of interesting because all of the images actually look um, really quite similar. Um, but Hugo's are a bit strange because they, you know, they're shown in galleries. And you can, like, you can buy them, you can collect them, um, which, again, I think has that kind of complex politics to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the question of um, visibility is so... Um, kind of guarded or policed by, you know, access. Um, I really appreciate the way that your work, you know, makes what may be assumed to be somewhat immaterial, um, mm -hmm. brings back the materiality of it. And I, I think in museum work, we're often taking something that is a material or an object, and I'm often wondering how much work the material can do. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're going from, say, the Gore-Tex um, jacket, and then you're saying, okay, how do I talk about the connection between water repellency and Gore-Tex and a Teflon pan and toxicity from its production, or et cetera. So it's almost like going from the material to the network to the impact, which often the object-basedness of a museum is not able to do terribly well. And so I often wonder about what can do what work. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, in, in focusing on photography, you're, look, you're, you're, you're taking photography back through painting traditions. Like I thought that was a really interesting discussion of like this depiction of the toxic sublime or the you know, contemplative, or is it journalistic, or kind of what, where where does it live in our history? And it made me wonder about what were the increasing number of documentary films on like the life cycle of things, like what work that is doing within this, this kind of question of helping us understand the materiality of what may otherwise seem immaterial, and kind of where does, where does photography fit within that? Um,
it also made me think, and this is too big a question, but of other photographic traditions, like, I mean, Jeff Wall does a lot of staging of, like, the fake battle, and it made me think, hey, wait a minute, what does, like, the photographic staging of a fake thing that looks a lot like a real depiction of a battle in Ukraine, what, what's that doing? I and mean, that's a much, much larger question, but um, anyway, especially in relation to the uh, documentary and the still photos that you're looking at, what, what is that community of practice? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question um, and a very complex one. And I think that one of the reasons I chose to focus on photography um, is in part because of all the mediums it tries, you know, continually since its inception to make claims for the fact that it is somehow unmediated or immaterial, even though, of course, um, that's never really the case and people kind of contest that throughout. Um, but I think that there's also something about photography which, you know, for better or for worse, has a trace of the real, right? I know that we can um, complicate photographic truth in many different ways. And I think that, you know, even moments like, you know, artists like Jeff Wall who are showing how things are mediated and staged, um, I think kind of draw those questions um, into view in really compelling ways. And so I think that tension between something that is incredibly mediated but seems unmediated um, is a kind of productive one to work with. But I actually don't spend very much time with very many um, documentary images. I'm actually, I found the ones that are kind of more productive to think through these kind of complex networks are strangely a little more abstract, which also kind of surprised me. Um, and yeah, and I think like there is, you know, so much work like this being done right now, so much coming out of media studies, but then also just kind of in popular culture through the sort of like story of stuff kind of documentary. And I think I'm interested in sitting in some of the more speculative dimensions of that. I mean, I, you know, this, like, it, it's kind of about rares, but it's also, like, not really. But sort of thinking about how these things can be entry points um, into larger questions that are kind of hard to get at otherwise. So sometimes I wonder if I'm asking too much for my objects, though. Like, that, that might be the case. But um, I have, like, loved to sit with them and think with them. And I'm so excited to think more about your sculptures because that feels so productive and I feel like after this project I am definitely not writing about photography again so <laughs> maybe it will be sculpture. I just I have, I have so many things going on in my head after this. Um, I was just like uh, when Chrissy was asking her question and I started thinking first I, I was thinking about this past summer I went to Leadville uh, and looked at the Molybdenum mine that's there, the, the, an enormous mine, really. And you, it's on this pass that you can't. There's no pullouts for obvious reasons, and you just like pulled over onto the, the side strip, and it, I illegally like filmed along <laughs> the, the skyline to get some images. And then we went to the local mining museum there that had a lot of very good photographic material, historic, of course, documentation mm -hmm. of this mine. Going from there over, I kind of ended up in this loop thinking about a bunch of uh, different articles that I had read that were documenting how there is a tourism involved in going to toxic lakes and paddling down toxic rivers. There's one close to LA that people had, it had blown up during the pandemic on Instagram because the water has such a strange, like, turquoise color that it makes for great photos. So people would travel there and paddle it down, launch their boats in, these, in this canal. And then it got shut down after it, it blew up so much that just the amount of people coming there drew a lot of attention. There is a lake in China where a lot of wedding photography is happening along the shores of this toxic lake because it has all these bacterial views. And um, so people really get drawn to the beauty of toxicity. And uh, so I just kind of like went down that rabbit hole because you were talking about how, how little there are art mm -hmm. images existing of, uh, of these mining operations. And, and then I kind of was like, it is true. But then again, there's all of this um, commercial industry that is just for beautification that exists around the toxicity. And I just like, there's more of a, it's not a question. <laughs> anything I'm saying. Like, it was just like all stuff that just came out. Yeah, I mean, toxicity is so fascinating because it often is so beautiful, yeah. right? I mean, when you think about like Turner's paintings, 
the skies are so saturated in part because of air pollution or, you know, the impressionists are really influenced by smog in the air. So there are these ways that, um, you know, toxicity like shapes and enhances vision. Um, but the photographer Edward Bertinsky, um, who does these kind of like large scale aerial, aerial photos of kind of industrial sites, I feel like really straddles that line. Like his photographs are so beautiful, mm -hmm. but they're very disturbing because you like you're you're seduced by them. And then you're like, that is a tailings pond. Yeah. Like, I should be repulsed. And I think that, I mean, they're very controversial. We can talk about them over breaks. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, but I think it's interesting, that sort of moment of recognition. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, so my talk is going to um, fall in line with, uh, like, it's just so rare that, that we get all different kinds of folks talking about rare earths in the same room. I... <laughs> I'm used to spending the first five. Uh, yeah, huh? I said this may be the first time. <laughs> yeah. I'm used to spending the first five to ten minutes of every talk that I give, having to go over like kind of what rare earths are in a really like layman's term sort of way. But uh, I'm not going to do that <laughs> this time because we've already had it. But like, um, I think my talk is going to change a little bit because uh, based on uh, what we've heard today, because. Um, it, it, it really speaks to a lot of these presentations and it's and it's I I find myself really fascinated because I do mostly research on rare earth mining as it applies to like uh, digital infrastructure like I've done research on uh, the use of uh, rare earth magnets and hard drives and you know the hit how, and that history um, but uh, one question that's uh, re that really started um, Fascinating me was uh, when I was when I started reading uh, Julie Klinger's you know history history of uh, of rare earth elements, and um, I started uh, I started noticing a sort of gap almost in in uh, the way that we talk about um, the life of rare earths before digital technology, and that there's a, there's this whole there's this whole uh, period of time in the early to the mid 20th century that um, isn't isn't talked about a lot and so what I want to what I want to talk about today is uh, sort of this time in rare earth history that exists kind of during and between um, you know the Wellsbach era that you that you talked about earlier Roger um, the gas the gaslighting entry and what happened sort of um, in the interim between between the gas lighting era, the gas mantle era, and um, and uh, when rare earths really started to sort of uh, take off in terms of their use in, in permanent magnet technology and stuff like that in the late 60s, uh, early 70s, and then into the digital era. And so um, I'm going to start off. Let's see here. Come on, man. Okay, so I guess we'll start here because I mean this is sort of the uh, this is sort of where we are. We I feel like every five or ten years or so um, we get a we get a flood of articles like this one that we see in Discover where it's like oh my God rare earths are crucial to modern society they're in everything and um, all of a sudden we need we need a ton of them so what what are they what are these rare earths you know they all, they, they they continue to be mysterious and so what i'm going to try to do is sort of like i come from i come from a film studies background and i'm in media studies so i'm going to try to sort of um, sort of uh, tell the history of rare earth elements alongside the uh, the history of uh, of cinema and media technology and so um because they've always been sort of shrouded in the sort of constructed mystery, and they're they're always sort of skating on the periphery of popular knowledge, in uh, in various ways. And so, I in this is some early work that sort of has come out of my fascination with some of these questions. I'm going to work to try to dispel some of this mystery, um, tracing how rare earths have been crucial agents in the development and character of early and mid 20th century media technologies. Um, and 
Uh, I argue that rare earths, since their first industrial applications in gas mantles, um, that illuminated city streets uh, throughout Europe and North America before and sort of during the dominance of electrical grids, before they sort of petered out, uh, have been pivotal media minerals. Like they have th th these, uh, you know, as we've seen today, they have these very unique visual qualities that provide, um, you know, very um, dramatic uh, colors and all sorts of all sorts of things like this. So they they've been media minerals um, for a long time, helping to shape the character of uh, mediated vision in the 20th century. They sort of helped to shape how uh, the conditions through which we see. So um, I'm trying to sort of build a, or at least tease out a little bit more of a robust cultural history of rare earths um, through the mid through the mid 20th century. Um, oh man, there we go. Okay. So I'm going to start, I think the, the, way that I, the way that I've set this up is, I, is I'm going to start tracing this te rare earth technology through multiple media spaces. Um, and it starts out here in the city. And it gets smaller and smaller and smaller because rare earths are good at making things smaller. So we start at the city, uh, the rare earth illuminated th thoroughfares. We come into the cinema in the mid 20th century. Um, where rare earth powered uh, carbon arc lamps facilitated projection to large audiences from the 1930s through the 1960s. And then um, in the 1960s, we'll move to the popularization of color television when rare, rare earth started entering the home in more important ways, uh, which occurred in large part due to uh, uh, the europium in the red phosphor of the cathode ray tube. So, um, you know, there's this interesting sort of almost personalization of rare earths. Like, you know, one question that sort of was, uh, I've been thinking about today, especially with your work, Siobhan, is uh, how do we, we have problems seeing rare earths a lot. Like, how do we better see them? How do we narrativize this history? How do we, vi how do we visualize it? And so um, I'm trying to think about it in this way of, uh, of the way that you know, through the history of rare earths and industrial applications, they've become closer to us in important ways, to the point where now we carry them around in our pockets. Um, so, and I don't want to just talk about the importance of rare earths in the uh, historical construction and adoption of these technologies, but to call attention to also the economic and geopolitical circumstances surrounding uh, rare earth supply chains and how these supply chains uh, weave through uh, this history. And uh, what I'm gonna be focusing on is uh, this era right here. It's uh, called the Monazite Placer era by the USGS. And this is, this is an era that I find that just doesn't uh, I find it so fascinating, but there, I, I, I don't think there's, there's nearly enough work um, sort of threading together uh, the importance of this era. So with, um, and as you can see, like, you know, we can see that rare earths have been talked about for a long time. You know, here, 1916, um, where it talks about uh, uh, the German, how the German monopoly on rare earths was broken during the First World War. Um, Chicago, Chicago's Daily Tribune, 1950. So rare earths have been in, dis in popular discourse for quite a while. Um, so as Roger so brilliantly um, talked about earlier, rare earths first became available for industrial use um, due to the realization of their unique optical properties, um, but it didn't really happen immediately uh, for a century after their discovery in Sweden. Um, they remained on the purview. Um, they remained just in the purview of curious chemists, sort of uh, languishing in laboratories away from public consciousness um, until uh, Mr. Wellsbach um, or Dr. Wellsbach uh, um, in around 1885 um, created the uh, the gas mantle, and uh, I won't burden us with more with uh, uh, more discussion of the gas mantle because uh, we got such a great presentation um, earlier, and we get to see some gas mantles, right? Um, we got some, we got some here, so that's great. Um, but it, uh, uh, I'll just say that the that the gas mantle 
uh, grew to become, yeah, the dominant, one of the dominant light sources on city streets in Europe and North America. Um, and the gas mantle um, sort of enjoyed about three decades of relative uh, success before being supplanted by the incandescent, incandescent bulb and other, uh, other, uh, other electric lighting technologies. Um, it, and in my mind, it sort of helped to sort of uh, write the visual grammar of the early 20th century urban night um, in important ways. Um, and at the same time, also as, Ro as Roger indicated earlier, helped establish this international trade in rare earth monazite sands. Um, so while today um, the basmacite ore um, is one of the, um, is where most rare earths, uh, kind of ore where most rare earths are sourced these days, but in uh, this monazite placer era, pre-1960, most rare earths came from these, uh, came from uh, monazite sands, uh, these alluvial sands. Um, and at the onset of the gas mantle industry, uh, Wellsbach and others refined thorium nitrate um, uh, from, um, from other reserves uh, then known in Sweden and Northern Europe. But as the industry expanded, it saw larger sustainable flows of rare earth ore. So monazite became very important. And then from 1902 to 1914, almost all monazite ore used in gas mantles came from Brazil by way of Germany. However, after the outbreak of World War I, the structure of the industry began to change. The war abruptly cut off global monazite supply, disrupting the, uh, the burgeoning uh, gas mantle industries in Europe and the United States. And in uh, 1916, um, another large deposit of monazite sand um, was found and became developed in uh, Travancore, India, which effectively broke the German monopoly, um, as we saw in here, 1916. And we can see in the New Zealand Sun talking about the, uh, the breaking of the German, German monopoly. Um, and so the early 20th century of the monazite industry is essentially a sort of a tug of war between various powers trying to leverage these huge supplies of Brazilian and Indian, uh, Indian monazite ore. So I'm going to talk about a different gas mantle company, um, another, another big one, um, the Lindsay Light Company. Um, so Britain, um, which controlled India at the, at the time, um, uh, opened a supply line of monazite sand from Travancore, and Lin the Lindsay Light Company started taking advantage of Britain's, uh, Britain's new supply line. Um, and in 1916, it constructed a fully operational rare earth separation and refining plant in Chicago, becoming one of the first independent thorium nitrate producers outside of Germany. Um, by 1917, the Lindsay Light Company had cemented itself as the proud figurehead of the international thorium and mantle trade, processing over two and a half tons of monazite sand each day, both for export and in-house manufacturing of its own uh, gas mantles. The gas mantle industry, however, as we know, would not last much longer. And by 1925, mantles were starting to be replaced in large, by large quantities of electric lights. Um, and this caused the monazite industry, um, which was largely dominated by just gas mantles. That was pretty much the only um, use for monazite at that, industrial use for monazite at that time. The industry um, almost completely collapsed um, in the mid-1920s. But uh, that is until other uses of monazite were discovered. So now we're into the 1930s. And so the gas mantle industry has collapsed. Um, and uh, companies are trying to find new uses for this, uh, this supply chain. Um, so by the mid-1930s, um, while Wells, the Wellsbach company sort of collapsed, Lindsay sort of pivoted and they successfully pivoted. So they became not just the Lindsay Light, but the Lindsay Light and Chemical Company. Um, and they, tradition, they transitioned entirely away from the production of gas mantles and instead be, began to exclusively focus 
on refining thorium nitrate and other rare earth materials for domestic industry and export. During this period, the largest markets for rare earth um, became flints, like mishmetal flints um, for lighters and ignition switches. And um, secondly, high intensity carbon arc lamps for cinema projectors, uh, searchlights, uh, fi like film studio lights, things like that. So this brings us to the movies. So we move from the city and now we move indoors into the cinema. So this is the, op this is the opening sequence from Ingmar Bergman's Persona, which is sort of, I show this because it's sort of this, this neat media archeological moment that reveals to us not only the mechanical power of cinema, but also the power of rare earth to sustain cinematic vision. So in this opening shot here, it was achieved by the electrification of wicks of rare earth oxide, uh, composed predominantly of cerium and lanthanum, woven through two cord carbon rods, which when put in contact, react together to create a sustained soft white luminescence. High intensity carbon arc light projectors were used in theaters beginning in the 1930s all the way through the 1960s when safer, cheaper xenon arcs largely replaced them. Uh, the carbon arc light and the uh, um, conditions through which rare earth elements came to give it its particular luminous qualities, and I'm talking about the high intensity carbon arc light here, sort of helps us to um, better understand and uh, come to grips with the, the, the particular minerality of cinematic light and, uh, and this uh, sort of prehistory of its projection. And so carbon arc lamps had been, they've been around for a while, since the 19th century, and had been commonplace in lighthouses and as floodlights in city squares um, since the mid 19th century. Um, however, they were too unruly for cinema projectors at the beginning and also required a source of electricity, which a lot of movie theaters lacked at the turn of the century. So during this time, theaters were still relatively small and, and got by with things like limelights and also gas mantles. However, as theater size grew, carbon arcs uh, were quickly incorporated into projector technology to take advantage of like, just how bright they were. Um, and as theaters became increasingly larger, some seating between three and 4,000 people, screen brightness became a crucial hinge point for growth. And so uh, what I'm looking at here is predominantly um, trade journals and like, um, uh, like American cinematographer, um, American projectionist, and uh, journals like this where, uh, where um, you know, folks working in the industry would write articles and talk about the need for uh, brighter projectors and how can we how can we get brighter projectors? Um, and um, you can see in a lot of com in a lot of articles in the 1930s through the 1940s, talk of replacing uh, carbon arc um, projection technology with the high intensity cord carbon rods, which uh, of course had the rare earths woven throughout, and um, what this did, the introduction of rare earth laid and high intensity carbon arcs in the early 1930s um, made everything a lot brighter, um, allowing for, for theaters to get bigger. It allowed for a 40% increase in screen brightness. Um, and also with the rise of color film in the early 1940s, high intensity carbon arcs helped theaters to standardize arc light intensity in order to properly project the full color spectrum. Because the other thing that the high intensity carbon arcs did was create a perfect black body radiator, which was allowed, which um, made it so that, uh, you know, when the, so that uh, the intensity didn't shift so that the uh, color could be projected properly so that, uh, that, you know, the technicolor wouldn't look weird. Um, so basically, Like the gas mantle, the high intensity carbon arc supported the infrastructure for a sort of emergent visual culture, right? 
So the, to the high intensity carbon arc, we can attribute a whole host of pre-World War II media events. So the scale, the scale of the release of things like Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz, you know, seen here, like look, look at all those people, right? The scale of these releases and the subsequent ubiquity of color cinema would have been nearly impossible without these high intensity carbon arc lamp projectors which needed rare earths to make them brighter and to um, make them uh, make the light more stable. So really, rare earths gave us Judy Garland, you know? <laughs> so, so, I mean, that's, I mean, sort of, not really, but like kind of, right? Um, we can, so like, and this is just sort of a, you know, I'll just leave it there. Yes, Rose gave us Judy Garland, right? Okay. So during this transitional period though, uh, for Lindsay Light and Chemical, which was at that point the largest supplier of rare earth material in the world, um, the purview of their operations significantly expanded. So in the early 1930s, during a time when it seems as if, you know, the gas mantle industry collapsed, uh, the mountain pass era wouldn't come for a little while, so this is, but this was an era of incredible growth for the rare earth industry, especially in West Chicago. Uh, the company moved from their home in downtown Chicago to West Chicago, where they built this sprawling rare earths facility, which was the largest single processor of rare earth ore from the 1930s through the early 1960s. So for about 30 years. Um, and the outbreak of World War II saw the company um, come under contract with the US government for the production of both hydrofluoric acid and thorium nitrate for the Manhattan Project. Um, and the government contract grew the business substantially and also dramatically increased the amount of imported monazite sand, 100% uh, 100 of, 100 of which came from India uh, by 1944. However, post-World War II politics um, complicated the availability of monazite um, and also like, you know, India's independence as well. Um, both India and Brazil issued successive embargoes on the export of critical minerals, which led to multiple searches for rare earth reserves in the US, uh, most of which failed until in a search for uranium, um, they were accidentally discovered um, at the Mountain Pass mine. So now we enter the Mountain Pass era. So in 1949, in between the Indian Brazil monazite export bans, the United States Geological Survey discovered this massive reserve on the California Nevada border. Um, so the Mountain Pass mine over the following three decades, um, through the consolidation of basic research during the Cold War uh, for rare earths uh, under the federal government. So we had, the, you know, in the 1930s um, and 40s, you know, Lindsay Light was this sort of private company, but in the Cold War, a lot of this basic research um, for um, rare earths and other minerals was consolidated under government agencies. Um, and the plentiful reserves at Mountain Pass allowed the US to um, once again become the world's largest miner and producer of rare earth oxides. So um, conversely, by the mid 1960s, the Lindsay Light and Chemical Company had lost most of its luster and status. It's struggled through the export bans. Um, and during that time, the company was sold a number of times to uh, first to American Potash and Chemical Company in 1958, and then to Kerr McGee in 1967, which then promptly dissolved the Lindsay name for good. Um, and then shortly thereafter, in 1973, the uh, rare earths facility in West Chicago shut down, which left the soil which left in the soil decades of radioactive waste. So thorium just leached into the ground and poisoned that whole area. And the last bits of that contamination weren't cleaned up entirely until about 2015, 2016. Like they had to dig up all these houses, like literally from foundations and all, and like bulldoze out all this, uh, all this soil, just take it somewhere. I'm not even sure where they took it. Um, so, <coughs> While the Lindsay Light and Chemical Company sort of faded into this environmental cataclysm, um, uh, uh, organizations like the Ames Laboratory and like the Mountain Pass Mine and other associated um, industries 
made large strides in expanding the utility of rare earth elements across new industrial sectors, including permanent magnets. Um, the samarium cobalt magnet was first introduced in the 1960s, which uh, was used in uh, lots of defense applications and stuff like that. Um, but also another important industrial sector was color television. And so this is the last sort of uh, media technology that I'm going to talk about. So now, you know, we started in the city, we moved into the cinema, and now in the 1960s, we're in the living room. So color TV wasn't invented in 1965. It had been around for a while. But that was the year that it took off. In 1964 alone, saw 1 million units leave the shelves, which was an increase of 77% over the previous year. And I'm sourcing this from you know trade magazines like Broadcasting Magazine and things like that. While this still represented a rather small proportion of television households, by 1971, just a few years later, almost half of the TV watching populace was enjoying color programming. So why had the question is, why had so many color TV consumers emerged en masse um, in 19, between 1965 and 1971? Which, you know, this is a complex question, but one of the key factors that accelerated the replacement of uh, black and white with color broadcasting was, one, a significant increase in brightness, driven by the ref which was uh, driven in large part by the refinement of the red phosphor in cathode ray tubes. The new phosphors that hit the market in 1964, uh, which first appeared in sets from the German manufacturer Sylvania, um, and then a few months later RCA, exhibited a pronounced increase in brightness and allowed for viewers to comfortably watch their sets in lighted rooms and, quote, see a more natural picture than heretofore attainable, according to Broadcasting Magazine in 1964. This phosphor, which is made from europium, um, was sort of the, the last thing that sort of finally helped catalyze a mass migration to color television in the late 1960s. And I'm trying to pay attention to this ad, too. I, I can't really see it. But I'm fascinated by these old color TV ads because they explicitly mention rare earths in, in the ads. They say, these, ad, the, these TVs use europium. You're going to want to buy this TV because this TV has europium in it. And I, you, don't, you don't really see that anymore. You don't, you don't see ad, ads for the iPhone saying, buy our iPhone. It's got europium. <laughs> this iPhone's got neodymium. You know, this, hard, this hard drive here, this hard drive's great. It's, you know, it's, it's got the rare earths in it. But in a lot of the early color television advertisements advertised the, uh, the addition of rare earths to their television as something that, that would uh, make it more colorful. And so... Um, it was sort of this rare moment where rare earths were sort of put on this put on the stage for all to see. Um, sort of a, a unique moment of visibility, which you know then disappeared. <laughs> so the following year, 1965-66 uh, TV season, NBC advertised itself as quote the full color network. Um, broadcasting all but two of its programs in full color. And after this, color television quickly became ubiquitous in most American middle-class households, due in no small part to this European phosphor, which continues to produce the brilliant reds in most digital screens today. Um, so, to close, in the 80s and 90s, rare earth magnets would come to define the digital storage industry, as well as other, other industries becoming the uh, you know the most widely used permanent magnets in the world. Um, the second incarnation of the U.S. rare earth industry, the Mountain Pass years, um, cemented the social and industrial utility of rare earth elements um, and brought rare earth technology into the home. But the Monazite era ha has largely been I don't want to say forgotten, but I. I, I think there, there are a lot of really neat, interesting stories from that era that, that should be surfaced. And I think that this group is doing a good job of like telling some of this history. I like it. Um, so um, I guess I just want to end by highlighting these two quotes. This one from BBC News in 2014 and this one from Popular Mechanics in 1950, showing how no matter what and no matter when, rare earths are always a mystery to us. Um, and I don't know what we can do to help make them more visible or more like comprehensible 
to uh, lay audiences, but I, for one, would like to see this trend disappear. <laughs> Where it feels like every, like I said, every five or so years, we have to sort, of, we have to reestablish that rarists are a thing, and they're in the stuff that we use. So um, yeah, we should know, we should know more about them. And uh, yeah, I'm finished. <laughs> so yeah, so this is the beginning of a of a larger research project that's kind of totally unconnected to my dissertation. So I welcome any questions, critiques, right, well, concerns. Saying, I think we have, uh, only have a little bit of time. Uh, I'd love to make sure our colleagues have anything to do. Uh, his presentation is maybe we'll take one question. Um, I don't know if it's really for one that you can. We'll have one later on. Yeah. I just have one comment about your final slide. Yeah. Why should we all know more about rare earth? What makes it different from, say, knowing about nylon or well, knowing about bricks or well, vinyl? Um, well, I think that... It's that, just my, yeah. my point is that this is the way that, that media and that people talk about materials, and it may not, in fact, be that nobody knows about rare earth. It's just that they burned and they forgot. Well, I think that, I think that part of it, um, part of why I think that we need to know more and acknowledge rare earths uh, more comprehensively, you know, has to do in part with you know, Maddie's presentation earlier, is that um, A, they're very, they're very, they're crucially important to the energy transition, and and B, rare earths have a good way of animate are, have a good way of animating political anxieties every 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 few years or so. They, you know, what te what technology is that not true? I mean, that that's a good question, um, and you know, to a large extent, you're you're correct. But uh, rare rare earths, especially lately, have been have been used as sort of a um, a reason. Uh, to drum up anxieties about energy security, about mineral security, about, and they are used in such a way that um, can create fears that lead to bad policy. That um, I don't know if I'm, but like I think that I think the importance of rare earths to things like the energy transition and the general, um, uh, I think there, there is a bigger danger in not knowing enough about them in, you know, for things like that. It's like if, if we allow, if we allow polit you know, the political establishment to drum up anxieties, like, you know, like Ted Cruz has recently been using rare earths as a, as a way to talk about uh, U U.S. Uh, U.S. mineral security and th and things like that, and rare earths, you know, have become sort of a floating signifier for uh, all all sorts of all sorts of political anxieties. And um, I would like to see them not used as a floating signifier for political anxieties anymore. So that's uh, I think that's my answer. And I uh, and also I this, I think this question of visibility is just connected mm -hmm. and then I think that through line through many of these talks uh, was really, really interesting. I hope you know, I thought it was more getting around the table. Um, but I will have to leave uh, I will have to ask uh, us to thank Zane and um thank you for your talk. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gustav, organizers, for inviting me to participate in this event. This is actually really kind of like invigorating for me to come down and hear about rare earths from so many different perspectives. I'll be your token scientist for the afternoon, I guess. Uh, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my perspective uh, leading an effort at Penn related to trying to work on sort of many of the problems that we've been talking about today. Uh, and it's uh, something that we have been doing in my research group uh, for some years. I mean, I, I've been so inspired by the remarks here today, I think I'm going to 
kind of change what I talk about on the fly. And in fact, sort of, you know, Maddie and others have uh, preempted me in many of the things I was going to discuss. So that's okay. Um, but I want to use rare earths as an object lesson in critical metals challenges and also talk about potential ways that chemistry can contribute to making uh, solutions. So we've heard some really fascinating remarks today about history, about culture, about, I'll take this off, uh, about art and the intersection of, you know, these weird elements with all of these different factors. And the standpoint of chemistry is, you know, to, to do fundamental studies on things like rare earths um, and also to try and to try and develop new solutions to many of the problems that we heard today, right? Like associated with mining and separations chemistry, which is really at the heart of all these issues of critical metals. So I'll start out with this uh, now obligatory slide for the afternoon. Uh, <laughs> but I think what I want to respond to a little bit here from the discussion is to say, you know, a big part of my job is educating students and the public about rare earths. And, um, you know, as an inorganic chemist, this is what I have worked on my whole career is metals, right? And there were things that inspired me when I was a student to get me into this field, which I will say that inorganic chemistry, you know, isn't you know, the largest aspect of the field of chemistry. It's somewhat smaller. And rare earth chemistry is obscure, even as far as chemistry goes. <laughs> uh, and so I think part of the reason why... Um, uh, why people don't know about rare earths is that even chemists don't know about rare earths. It's actually not part of the education of chemists to learn anything about rare earth metals. And so, Zane, I think you had something in your slide about high school students learning about rare earths. They really don't, uh, unless they watch YouTube videos themselves about them. They do now, though. Right. <laughs> Somewhat. I mean, because of the work of SHI and, you know, other entities. And maybe because it's somewhat more part of the popular uh, consciousness because of issues like this, right? I mean, the fact that we all carry them around, which is something that I, that I was going to say and everyone has said here today. So I, th I think uh, for me, I wanted to emphasize that that's an educational hook. That's a way to get students interested in something that they might not otherwise be exposed to, and it does have real implications in our lives around the formation of policy and the growth and use of renewable energy carriers. I would say that's why it's important that students know about rare earths or anyone knows about rare earths, that it's part of a larger issue. It's an object lesson, if you will, <laughs> for larger challenges in critical materials and renewable energy. So that's the position that I want to take. And I want to refer as well to this beautiful report that Maddie Stone referred to on the role of critical minerals in the clean energy transition. And so I've, I've selected a couple of complementary bar graphs from that report uh, to highlight here in my remarks uh, around the fact that uh, and actually renewable energy carriers have a much larger materials intensity. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So if you evaluate sort of the kilograms of stuff that you need to produce a megawatt of power with these different energy sources, wind power, solar photovoltaics, have a large, much larger materials intensity than we find for traditional fossil carriers. So as that he indicated, that implies that a shift, this coming essential shift in electrification is going to demand significantly more mining or ways to get these, these uh, elements. Um, and in fact, that the materials diversity is also much uh, larger in renewable energy technology. And so we need different kinds of stuff which is why people talk about the 30 or 100 different elements in a cell phone. It's so interesting, the range of number of elements that you see reported in the media that actually fit, you know, go into a cell phone. Nobody seems to agree on that number. Uh, it's big, though, and it's growing. I think I should just do it in my lab. It's just like dissolve a cell phone and then do a complete <laughs> metals analysis really to get to the answer. Well, someone has to do it, and I, I'm willing to do it. Um, so the other thing uh, about this is that the sort of, as stated, if you evaluate a particular element in this context, and this is true across the board, that sort of typical projections around, you know, let's open new lithium mines because we want uh, 
nor lithium ion batteries are not going to meet the needs of the sustainable solution uh, as, as articulated in this IEA report. And actually the director of the IEA said it best when she said the data shows a looming mismatch between the world's strength and climate ambitions and the availability of critical minerals that are essential to realizing those ambitions. And so as a scientist, this is a problem that's uh, crying out for some fundamental research. What are the inherent engineering and science limitations that are creating this framework? And how can we develop fundamentally new solutions to this problem, a technocratic approach? But you know, this is kind of the only uh, solution as far as I'm concerned in order to achieve the shift to renewables. I think that we're gonna electrify personally we're going to electrify sooner or later. We have to. It's going to happen. It's just sort of a matter of what cost in terms of the opening of new mines and the environmental damage, and as Maddie and others have said, the sacrifice zones that may emerge as a result of that shift. Um, so when we're thinking about critical metals in my work and the work that I do in my center at Penn, you get, there are different lists that are established to define what a critical metal is, but basically a critical metal is something that has been identified as being essential for some purpose and having a supply risk. So it doesn't have to be related to energy science per se, although that is the one that is sort of most commonly associated with uh, critical metals these days, although it's certainly related to defense applications as well. Uh, and people talk about it in the context of national security. Ted Cruz, I've had staffers from Tom Cotton's office call me up and try and ask me questions about these things. So it is certainly bipartisan. Uh, uh, and it's, it's interesting that it's, you know, on sort of defense on the one hand and kind of scaremongering and, you know, under the auspices of the green energy transition on the other. Um, so in the, in the work group that I work with, which is, um, I'll show you a little bit more about in a second, we're actually interested in developing new chemistry to address many critical metals targets across the periodic table. Um, and so much of my work uh, in my group has been in rare earths in the earlier part of my career at Penn. And now we're branching out into sort of, you know, this has become too, people know about rare earths, so now I need something else to do that people know nothing about. And that's, Cancel the niobium chemistry. Uh, and this is, I'm, I'm sort of a contrarian among contrarians in as much that, you know, when I was figuring out what I want to work on as a chemist, I wanted to do inorganic chemistry, which is the metals in the periodic table. And then I wanted to work in an area that no one was working in, which was in the rare earth metals. So uh, just sort of turned out that it turned into a thing after that. And so <laughs> here I find myself. Um, but it's critical metals are platinum group metals. They're, now they're nickel, they're zinc, they're copper. I've got the targets for the center up there. These are the ones that we're working on in particular, but the list actually includes uh, you know, something like 50 different chemical elements. And so what does criticality originate from? Um, so here's my sort of you know, impressions about why metals or minerals might attain a critical status and you know, be assigned on one of these lists. Well, one of the key ones is environmental challenges. And so what does that mean? It means that um, the chemistry to bring these things to your cell phone right now is extraordinarily primitive. Uh, it's very non-selective. That means that it requires huge amounts of things like strong acids and, uh, and energy and time in order to purify a given chemical element in this context. And so that means that it's very waste intensive. So there's the action of like digging up the minerals out of the ground, but then there's the action of beneficiation that's extracting the metals that you want from the ore. And with rare earths in particular, uh, you always get a mixture. And in order to deliver the rare earths into a piece of technology and have that technology be useful, they must be purified. And the process of purifying them is very energy intensive and waste intensive. So herein lies the chemical problem. And it is, in fact, that characteristic that they have such a chemi chemical similarity down here in the basement of the periodic table um, that actually dictates the fact that they have extraordinary properties because of their electronic structure and where they're placed in the periodic table. Those things are part and parcel, OK? Um, they're two sides of the same coin in terms of the chemistry. So the 
The environmental challenges means that the supplies are concentrated in a small number of places, which can in invariably lead to trade tensions around who's producing rare earths and who needs rare earths. So that contributes to criticality. And then also, as we've heard today, the exploitative labor practices at the front end of the supply chain are really significant, and we're gaining an awareness uh, through a lot of important reporting that's been occurring uh, in the past five or 10 years. And the, the people on the front lines of the clean energy revolution are also bearing the brunt of the pollution associated with the clean energy revolution. Moreover, global conflicts uh, really contribute to element criticality as well. There's been some recent reporting about how the war in Ukraine has created tremendous volatility in the market for nickel and platinum group metals and lithium. Uh, evidently, there are supplies of lithium in Ukraine that are, you know, of course, now uh, because of this terrible war, no one knows what's going to happen to them. But these mineral uh, commodity prices really suffer from uh, a volatility associated with global conflict. And so to promote a clean energy transition, we need to have stable supplies of uh, all these critical elements in order to facilitate this transfer, this you know huge shift that we heard Maddie talk about. Um, I mean, the other aspect are sort of the general uh, popularity of these elements in the Earth's crust, right? Um, and so we find that in many cases, so if, if you look at the most rare metal, so this is a USGS plot, and basically, it just depicts the relative abundance of elements in the Earth's crust compared to silicon. And it's a lot of a logarithmic scale. So things um, lower down are much more uh, rare in the Earth's crust, elements like platinum and gold and iridium and osmium. So those things are much, much more hard, harder to find in terms of their absolute abundance than rare Earths. So rare Earth supply problems are due uh, largely because of the processing. So we have a lot of good sites for them around the world. We know where to find them. We know where we, where we can probably find them well into the future. Uh, it's just that nobody is really willing to produce them on the scale that they're willing to produce them in China currently. And so we heard, I can't remember which speaker talked about Mountain Pass today. Maybe it was you, Zane, talking about uh, the production at Mountain Pass being something like now 15% of the world supply. But there's a footnote to that in as much as that they don't purify individual rare earths at Mountain Pass. The concentrates that are mined and processed there in the initial stage are all shipped to China where they undergo separations chemistry. So uh, this is a key aspect is that capacity. It's not just having critical metals. It's the having them and having the capacity to purify them to the uh, levels that are needed in order to be useful in technology. And so this is a very dynamic landscape. There are a lot of small companies and startup companies and concerns in places like Texas that are now saying that they're going to do rare earth separations chemistry in the sort of uh, re relatively looser regulatory climate in a state like Texas. But it's still a capacity that, you know, is not anywhere near what China has to be able to do this processing to deliver purified rare earths. And that's, again, because the separations chemistry for rare earths is so non-selective. Uh, the use of solvent extraction is the only way to really do it at scale so far uh, and be able to produce these large quantities of, of elements like rare earths. So I like to show this. This is an old slide, but uh, it shows the picture of the global supply chain of rare earths in 2009 and associated with sort of criticality questions uh, in 2009. I mean, this is what got the world interested in rare earths uh, around this time when the Chinese government uh, basically had a reduction in export quotas and it blew up in the news about uh, the fact that there was going to be this shortage. And there wasn't, but it was, you know, definitely an economic bubble that formed around that time where dysprosium, this late rare earth metal that's doped into the neomagnets to give them their high performance characteristics. And in fact, each neomagnet has a varying amount of dysprosium in it, which is why the magnets aren't exactly interchangeable. I mean, Apple may claim that they can recycle 100% of these magnets for one application. That may be true. But in terms of all the ways that dysprosium and neodymium are used, that is not the case. So that's another sort of technical aspect of this. But this was the element to buy and put under your bed in 2010. Uh, <laughs> 
of course, you know, I bought all the stock here and then it all <laughs> crashed, so don't take any stock advice from me. Uh, and the, the, you know, the reason in particular for rare earths, as I already said, is this is the few pictures of Bautau that we have around the, the mine tailings like there is the environmental aspects of it. So we've heard about bastocyte, we've heard about uh, monazite, those primary minerals for the production of rare earths. I mean, the, the other aspect of that, that really, in terms of the key environmental damage, is the fact that for bastocyte, you're producing an equivalent, several equivalents of fluoride every time you produce one equivalent of rare earth that you want to separate. And in fact, I mean, the other aspect of the economics of this is bastocyte uh, is, a, is sort of really a pain in the butt because it's mostly lanthanum and cerium, which don't have a market the way that the late metals do. So they, that's, another reason, that's, that's another reason why I do a lot of serum chemistry in my lab. It's an element looking for a market uh, because something like 50% uh, of the rare earth content in bastocyte is um, lanthanum and cerium. And they just throw it away at Mountain Pass. They have no good use for it. I mean, you know, it goes into self-cleaning ovens. It's the thing that, you know, makes ovens do self-cleaning, but there's not that many ovens in the world, Roger, to be able to have a market for cerium. <laughs> uh, so I love cerium because it does a lot of interesting things in terms of its chemistry, and it's basically dirt cheap. So, you know, an enterprising chemist, uh, if I was one of those, could do something useful with cerium that would, that would contribute. Um, so there's all these kind of in interesting aspects of, the, of what particular rare earths that you find and then how the markets are interrelated. But this is the problem with the production of bastocyte in particular that it produces huge amounts of fluoride waste as well as thorium that's coming along for the ride in uranium in uh, bastocyte and other rare earth containing minerals. Uh, and so this is the output of that. And so you're not going to avoid this necessarily in terms of primary production, but maybe you can improve on the separations chemistry, which is also another very waste intensive process. And what we'd like to do in my lab ultimately is like having invested in extracting rare earths and paid this waste cost already, can we recycle them instead of having to do this again, right? Uh, and so that's why we have been looking at, I'm going to show you a few pictures of molecules. Uh, we've been looking at molecules that can do a simple separation of dysprosium and neodymium doesn't use solvent extraction as the means to do it, and uh, because we think fundamental chemistry like that can really make a contribution. So in this scheme, you could take a permanent magnet, or you could take a mass of permanent magnets that you've gotten out of a data facility, and I, you know, uh, cell phones and electric vehicles, and put them all together and chemically treat them. Right. So that sort of eliminates the storage, the, the sorting problem. If you can chemically treat them and extract out purified elements that you want, then we think such a thing would add value. Okay, so this is a paper that we published in 2015 where we did that with a system of something that we created. I also want to make a connection here to what we do, maybe a little bit to what you do, because I really think that chemistry is a creative enterprise. And we have to visualize new molecules. This is a molecule that did not exist on Earth until we made it in my lab. And so that process is exciting to me, to capture something that hasn't existed before in your hand the first time, and to experience it, because the color of that compound is unique, and no one has ever experienced that before we created it. So that aspect of it to me is really fun, and that's one of the reasons why I'm a chemist, is the experiential aspect of it. Um, this guy is a microbiologist. He clearly has his own passions about this as well. Uh, he's dipping into a volcano. Okay, so this is a, a volcanic mud pot called the Solfatara Crater in Italy. So I want to give you a little bit of a sort of technical update here about rare earth separations that I think are really exciting and promising before I talk about other critical metals. This is Arjun Pol. Uh, and what Arjun Pol is doing here is he was doing a study uh, leading up to this publication of this paper in 2014 to try and identify if any organisms on Earth actually used rare earths in their biology. And no one had ever found any sort of weird creature to do this, right? You know, we have a general understanding of what the chemical elements are that make up life, and rare earths were never part of that picture. 
this guy thought that maybe he could discover a microorganism that did. And there were others who thought it would be possible prior to this as well. And sure enough, he reported in this paper this microorganism that had an essential growth requirement for rare earth elements. Okay? And it turns out in the en enzymatic chemistry, the way that this organism extracts energy from fuel to drive its life cycle, it actually has an essential requirement for rare earth metals, which is actually extraordinary to have something discovered like this you know, only in 2014. So what does that mean for separations? Well, it means that nature actually has evolved the machinery with which to extract rare earths from the environment and do it in a very clean and energy efficient way. Okay, And so there has been a huge explosion of the field of the biochemistry of the rare earth metals which now makes up a lot of the studies that are going on in fundamental work to be able to extract rare earths you know, safely and cleanly without using conventional techniques. Okay, So what this, uh, this is work that's been going on at, at Penn State, fundamental work by a biochemist whose name is Joey Catrugo. And what Joey Catrugo did was he identified the transport protein that these organisms use to move rare earths around and pick them out of the environment selectively. So rare earths exist at very low concentrations everywhere. But this bug figured out a way to pull them out of the environment to use in its biochemistry with you know, just an amazing selectivity. And so Joey discovered what protein the bugs used to do that. And he took it and he appended it into a system where you could extract and separate rare earths selectively from everything else. So we were talking about extracting rare earths from coal earlier. It's actually a terrible idea, I'm sorry. Uh, because the concentration of rare earths is so low, even in that coal byproduct, right? So if you're trying to do solvent extraction or conventional chemistry to get at that material, you would never make any money. And it would be sort of a, uh, a fool's errand. You, it's not a practical solution. So that's why it's a fundamental research problem. However, now we have this protein that nature uses to extract rare earths from very, very low concentration sources, and this protein can effectively pull it out of that coal byproduct at the expense of everything else. So basically, he's put it onto a system that he can attach in a column, and all of the ele other elements flow through the column unimpeded, and only the rare earths stick, okay? Even at very, very low concentrations. And then he can use different acid washes to pull out the rare earth that he wants from this mixture. So this is the new biochemistry of the rare earth metals that's, that's transforming separations. It's Joey and it's some other chemists at Lawrence Livermore National Lab that are showing that this can work. It's really exciting. So it's that kind of excitement and context that I'm working with this group of people on the problem of critical materials generally, or critical metals generally. And so we're going after all these targets now. We learn a lot from rare earths, and we can apply it in other contexts, like tantalum and niobium, or lithium, or cobalt, or nickel. And so this group of people at these universities across the country are all working together on this problem from a fundamental standpoint. So I'll give you just a couple examples of some recent research work. OK, is gold a critical metal? No, gold is not a critical metal. But you would think that gold would be very highly optimized in terms of its chemistry. It's not. Gold chemistry is terrible. There are two ways to separate gold. One of them is using elemental mercury, and the other is using sodium cyanide. Both of them are terrible reagents, and they pollute communities all over the world. That's what I mean when I say the, primitive, the, the chemistry to do metal separation is extremely primitive. This is the alloying of gold with mercury. It looks like the mercury is eating the gold. It kind of is. Um, so people, artisanal miners all over the world will you know, extract low-grade gold sources with uh, elemental mercury, and then they heat up the mercury, and the mercury vaporizes, and they're left with the gold, but the mercury vaporizes and you know, goes into them and their families, so that's not good. Um, so in the center, we've been thinking about, um, okay, here's another picture of that. We've been thinking about other technologies. Here's the cyanide process. You can react gold and low sources with sodium cyanide. You didn't think you were going to get a chemical reaction here today, but here's one. It's oxidized, and then you can make the sodium cyanoaurate material. It makes strong base as a result, too. But if you spill cyanide, so cyanide, this is the industry that uses more cyanide than anything else. And so if cyanide spills into the watershed, it causes fish kills. It causes huge problems associated with the local environment, right? So 
can't we find a better way to extract gold? So uh, through some work in the center, uh, uh, some chemists at Northwestern have figured out that you can use this molecule, which is called alpha cyclodextrin, and you can combine that with certain gold salts. Let's see if this video works. No. You can combine that with certain gold salts in order to uh, selectively, I'm going to really mess myself up here, selectively precipitate, no, that's going to work, uh, gold from a solution. So this is a solution of that cyclodextrin being added into different gold-containing solutions, and you can see this precipitate evolve. So this is a better way to concentrate gold because this molecule is very benign. Anybody can use In fact, you use it in Febreze spray. You use one of its relatives in Febreze spray. So this is a, a kind of a compound that's been used in other consumer products. So with the right combination of salts, you can transform the process for the, uh, for, use, for the chemistry of gold to precipitate gold in a sustainable way. And we can actually reuse this reagent and do the process over and over again with it instead of, you know, vaporizing mercury into people's homes. So that's the kind of thing that we're working on discovering. We've also done this kind of chemistry in the center with spent freeway catalytic converters. These are critical metals now. So these, you hear about catalytic converters being stolen un, from under cars. That's because the price of platinum rhodium is way up, right? Uh, and so these are recycled by industry uh, using caustic chemicals and toxic reagents. In our work, we've shown you can use this cucubitrol molecule in a similar way to selectively precipitate different precious metals out of solutions that you can obtain from those catalytic converters. And so we can clean up the chemistry that way. Um, a couple other quick examples. We've also done some chemistry now anticipating the solar panel, uh, uh, massive amount of solar panels that we're going to have become decommissioned if, the sh if and when the shift to de de uh, electrification occurs, and we're sure that it will. Um, these are specifically on cadmium telluride containing uh, uh, solar panels, we can do new chemistry to allow the recycling of those using very benign reagents just the same. So in this case, we're using a chemical oxidant that's actually found in Comet Cleanser uh, to recycle cadmium telluride, actually specifically tellurium, which is a critical metal out of solar panels. And so we get these sort of nice, interesting solutions of tellurium that come out and it can just precipitate colors and the experiential aspect of the chemistry. Finally, we're also working on lithium. And so a sustainable solution here is a new polymer that we can make that has a, a binding site. So chemists are going to visualize something like this before it exists. And they anticipate that the void space in this molecule will be able to take up the critical metal selectively. That's exactly what we were doing here in the previous example uh, with Febreze as well. Febreze works by having a hole in this molecule that sucks up the stink molecules, literally. <laughs> That's where the stink goes, is in the middle of the uh, cyclodextrin. But in our case, we're using the, the void and the other overall chemical structure to suck up the gold molecules in these cases. Okay. So chemists visualize and create new structures that haven't existed before that have the space to be able to accommodate their target. In this case, the target is lithium chloride, a salt. Uh, and if we could take lithium up selectively, perhaps we can recycle these lithium ion batteries. And so in this protocol, a polymer was created that has sites on it that recept the lithium. And you can put in the lithium containing solution, for example, from a brine that you want to pull lithium out of from a primary source, and lithium binds. Then you can wash away all the other ions. And then you use a different solvent, and lithium pops out again. And then you can dry the, you can get this solution of lithium enrichment, and you can dry the polymer and reuse it again. So we're not using toxic reagents here to do the lithium abstraction or recycling. We're just using this polymer that swells up and then gives off the lithium. This is what the polymer looks like. So this is what the chemistry is about. And it's exciting. And it's a it's a it's a point, it's a touch point to talk to people and talk to students with all the kind of hard problems that you read about in the press around these issues and say, we can make, we can improve this situation. We just need some sort of like creativity and drive and visualization of molecules that we then create and test in this context in the lab. So that's what the center does. 
We talk about chemistry. We talk about the associated social and political issues related to critical metals. And we do outreach with students and the general public to try and inform people and train students about uh, these really important issues. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And let's talk. I mean, and as you said, Zane, right, like it's, it's an entree, it's a starting point for understanding how, for me as an educator, chemistry uh, impacts all of these issues outside of the field, right? I mean, I, and sometimes, sometimes I think about it's part of the negativity that people have associated with chemistry, that rare earths remain a mystery, right? Like, if, you, if there was sort of a, a better feeling about chemistry somehow, <laughs> then people would be more motivated to go out and do a little bit of work on their own about aspects of chemistry that they might not cover. But um, because rare earths, you know, have this mysterious aspect to them, you know, they show up in video games and there's these quotes like, Samarium is the new opium, right? Like all this kind of cultural <laughs> stuff associated with it. That's an entree into a discussion about what rare earths are and why they're important. And that contributes to scientific literacy and, you know, educating people generally about this interrelated set of issues which I think is very attractive and interesting, and as an educator is, is very important to, to provide a broader context of what, why chemistry is important in the world. So that's what I would say. Go ahead, Mindy. Yeah, thanks so much for bringing up the microbial research. Uh, that's so cool. And I think we talked about it a year ago, and mm -hmm. then I forgot to follow up on it, so mm -hmm. I'm really glad you brought it up in this talk again today. Um, I'm curious how far out we are, in your view, from some of this basic microbial research um, translating into like new remediation yep. or biomining strategies. I think it's one of the most, if not the most promising strategy out there right now to actually have a significant impact. And the, the, some of the groups that are working on that, the, I think the chief groups are working on that are supported by DARPA, which means they have real milestones associated with their work and their delivering, as far as I understand. This proof of concept paper, I mean, that paper in ACS Central Science is extraordinary in what they were able to deliver in that context, literally from these extremely low-grade ores. There just really isn't a better, faster, easier way to do that using water solutions, right? So I think it's extremely promising. And if of anything at the moment, um, that's the one that I think is going to have the most impact for errors. Yeah. Um, just following that, I'm wondering what an operation, a microbial operation like that, would look like at scale. Mm -hmm. Like it is, like what a, se a separation plant using that type of tech would look like. For right. Example. Well, it could probably take a couple of different forms, and so maybe it's a hybrid of old and new, new and old technology. Um, but the key aspect here is that there's some kind of media with which the the protein is bound and allows for a separation. So this, this is called a solid liquid separation because the protein is immobilized on its bead and then the stuff that it's separating is flowing through the system and it's grabbed as it goes by. Um, so this can be challenging to do at scale. One of the important historic rare earth separations technology is called ion exchange chromatography that was developed by Frank Spedding at Ames National Lab during the Manhattan Project. And that is somewhat related to this in that they both use a column of material where something is being passed through, something stops or slows down, and the rest of the stuff goes through. So it can be challenging to do that on a large enough scale in a short amount of enough time uh, to get enough material produced to have an impact. So I think that's what, they're, that's what I suspect they're working on right now. So it's a question of, you know, can they deliver the selectivity uh, by making the smallest possible column or having the beads arranged in a certain way or having a, uh, a coating of the protein material such that, you know, it's more or less effective to pull out rare earths. They're kind of figuring out all these sort of engineering specifications of the technology now. But even with sort of a relatively unoptimized system, 
they show that you could do this for low grade waste. And there's just nothing else out there that really delivers in the way that this does, at least as far as I know. Yeah, so that's why it's so compelling. So I don't know the answer to that. I don't know like what is needed to bring this to scale. I'm not a process guy really. I'm just like, you know, let's make the <laughs> molecules and have fun, right? And like, let's see colors and visualize things. But uh, I let other people worry about that. But you know, as for my, in my opinion, this is something that has significant promise. Yeah, that sounds great. Like, what are the, the waste products that, like, you know? There's a little acid here, but uh, that's not bad. And, in fact, I mean, this is done in water, which is one of the reasons why it's extraordinary. There is no organic solvent to do the countercurrent solvent extraction. It's just water. So. Can I uh, follow up on this? Um, because you identified the molecule that does that, you don't actually need the organism or bacteria Correct. to be involved in Correct. that process. You're not potentially releasing massive amounts of an organism that now that starts spreading over the world. Right. Well, in fact, you, like, I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a concern of, I mean, yeah. there's that yeah. other breakdown process where they're thinking yeah. of using fungi, and then you just don't know what you do with that. That's right. It's That's an right. organism that has its own life, and you need to yeah. potentially control it. But then I just wanted to clarify that I understood it's eliminated. Basically. That's right. The organism is no longer involved. Yeah. The organism was studied in the initial stages to understand you know, that it did, was taking up rare earths at these very low concentrations to use in its biochemistry. And then it was like, okay, let's take a close look at it and find the protein that makes that magic happen. But now that that protein has been identified, it's been sequenced, its structure has been determined, and uh, we don't know why it works that well, but we know what, it, what the structure of it is. And so it can be synthesized uh, otherwise, up, apart from the organism. It'll probably be cheapest to use the organism to make it and then just like lice the organisms open and get the protein out. But um, you don't have to do it that way. You could also synthesize it with the synthesizer, protein synthesizer. So um, yes, it's not, the organism isn't needed. But even if it was, that organism is, you know, that, that protein is present everywhere. I mean, that's the other thing. We, those things were found in volcanic mud pots. But in fact, these organisms are now, are now known to be all over the world. They've been identified in all different environments. In the ocean, uh, on the backs of leaves, they're out here, right, right here in Philadelphia. If you, there was a group at uh, San Jose who took some leaves uh, off of trees. There's a note in Nature magazine about this a few years ago. And they pressed the leaf into like an agar growth medium where one half of it had rare earths on it and the other half did not. And then they took the leaf off and they saw what organisms grew. And then the side with the rare earths, there was this huge development and growth of these organisms, much more so than the un-rare earth side. And that's because this kind of organism is something called a methylotroph. And they use methanol as an energy carrier in their biochemistry. And methylotrophs um, have evolved to uh, be sort of synergistic or symbiotic with trees, with plants. And so these organisms were discovered in that environment, and it was shown that rare earths were important in their biology just anywhere. So this is the other exciting aspect of this, is understanding how rare earths are actually present in low concentrations and do affect biology in a ubiquitous way. Uh, so it's an exciting, it's an exciting time to be in that field.